Welcome, Wabam crew. Secure your tinfoil hats, buckle down tight, and hold on loosely as we soar over the rocky tops of the La Platas on a rocky mountain high, get sucked into the vortex of the Four Corners, and settle down snugly at Mall Marker 420 in colorful Colorado. It is Saturday, January 19th, Sunday, January 20th, for those of you across the pond and beyond. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to you, and welcome to We Are Paradox Media's Late Night in the Rockies. I'm your host, Tessa TNT, and we are live from the Mile High Clubhouse tonight. If you're listening live to us right now, you're listening to us on Spreaker.com. You can also find us live at KPNL Radio, which you can find at kpnl-db.com. Also, in your free time, when you're working, working out, or working it, feel free to listen to us at Spreaker, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, iTunes, iHeartRadio, CastBox, Tumblr, SoundCloud, TuneIn Radio, Deezer, Podcast Addict, and Podcast Chaser. Make sure you check out and like our Twitter as well as our Facebook. And you can also find us on YouTube. Make sure you like and follow us there and make sure you give that bell a little tickle. That way next time we have a show come out, you will be made aware of it. So I hope you guys have had an awesome weekend so far. Thank you so much once again for joining us. And tonight, I have a treat for all my guys and gals out there. Tonight, we will be talking to Mr. Richard. Welcome, Richard, and thanks so much for hanging out with us tonight. Um, my name is Robert, my dear. Oh, I'm sorry. Robert <laughs> Rigi. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> Where did Richard come from? Hmm. I don't know, we have to investigate that. We'll have to look into that. Definitely. Richard, wow. oh. Well, good evening, good day to everyone. And um, yes, my name is Robert Rigge. And tonight I will be talking about demons and angels and my experience with both. And I'm looking forward to this so very, very much. It's been about a year, I think, since I have been on with Tessa. And I am looking forward to this so very, very much. Just briefly, something about me is that I do many things within the paranormal field, uh, which is very close to my heart. And even closer to my heart is that I volunteer at many, many places around the country. Last year at this time, I was in New Mexico, and I was volunteering with um, some Catholic, religious Catholic sisters on a, um, at a homeless shelter and soup kitchen in New Mexico, and I was with our Navajo brothers and sisters as well as our Zuni brothers and sisters, and I was there from January 1st until the end of May, and it was a wonderful, wonderful experience. I am here in Illinois now. I'm having uh, some physical problems, and uh, but those have been taken care of, or they're in the process of being taken care of. And <clears throat> and when at the end of March, then I will be leaving for Pine Ridge um, Indian Reservation in Pine Ridge, South Dakota. Oh, wow. So I am look I'm looking forward to that so very much. I did have. I, um, I don't talk, I don't like to talk about my ailments, but um, I had 15 polyps removed from my throat and uh, three of those polyps have uh, some precancerous cells. I'm not supposed to talk a lot um, at this moment, but I really didn't do a lot of talking today. So hopefully my voice will uh, be okay for the next several hours. Okay. Awesome, and, and I'm sorry about what's going going on with you as far as that goes. That's pretty uh, crazy and, and kind of scary. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, it is what it is. Yeah. You know, we all go through physical ailments, you know, with this COVID, this pandemic that is going on. And you know firsthand, my friend, um, that it has really changed many, many lives of our loved ones mm-hmm. and of our friends and such like that. And this COVID just doesn't affect one person. There's a ripple effect, as you know. It affects it it it, it, it affects really everyone's loved one. It changes one's mindset. It um there's a lot of worry, as you know. Uh there's a lot of silent tears. 
okay? And, um, but by the grace of God and or the universe, depends what you believe in, um, that I believe that everything works out the way it is supposed to. Right. Okay, you know? And um, sometimes we feel like we're going to, it's like, oh my Lord, you know, I don't, you know, I don't think I could go on and things like that, right? Um, but we do find the strength. We do find the inner strength. And a lot of times the strength that we feel that we don't have and all the ones that we do, I truly believe that comes from our guardian angel or from other angels. They can be, they can be heavenly angels or they can be angels uh, that are working in hospitals. You know, people who come to our lives. Um, and I believe that God or the universe, whatever you want to say, puts people in our lives for a very specific reason. We may not know of that reason this very moment, um, but in time we usually will. Okay. And, um, and uh, so I do believe in angels. I believe in heavenly angels. I believe that there are angels walking on this earth to assist us. A lot of times they are in disguise of poor people, in disguise of the homeless. But they can also be in a person who's wearing a $10,000 suit also, okay? And, and so in my experience with angels started many, 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 many years ago. You know, you know, I'll be 67. I am 67 now. And so angels have been a very, a very, um, very important in my life. I believe that we all have guardian angels. Maybe not one, maybe two, maybe three, maybe four. Some of these guardian angels can be past relatives of ours who have passed, or they can be good friends of ours who have passed before us. And those angels are there to assist us in what we need. My friends, one of the questions that I get all the time is, what is my angel's name? And what I have suggest to folks is that you talk to your guardian angel. Ask your guardian angel what, what their name is. And in time, and you know, when in time you will find out, and my experience is that, um, is that when you ask your guardian angel's name and do it, you know, do it two or three times a day, do it before you go to sleep, okay? And a lot of times in my experience is that, that when I have asked people to do that and then a name pops in their mind, it can be anything, okay, any name. And I truly believe, I truly believe then that is possibly the angel's name. But we all have guardian angels. You know, some maybe people one of mine laugh. are Richard. <laughs> <laughs> maybe so. Maybe so. Maybe so. Um there's um there are and people ask me, well, are they male or female? And you know what? A lot of the, the angels that that I have come in uh, um, into and that have come into my life, some of them are male, some of them are female, some of them uh, some of them are they don't have a sex. You know what I mean? Some of them have wings, some of them don't. You know, it is us that we that we need to know the sex of an angel. That's just very important to us. Is it a male or female, right? And um, sometimes that's really not important. It's not. You know, I have two angels, a little baby. Her name is Mary Angelina. And then I have um, Raphael, the archangel. And both have been with me for many, 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 many moons, as they say, right? And so I rely on my angels, you know? That, you know, one thing about angels is that just like with God, Jesus, God, you know, um, is that they don't mess with our free will. They just don't. OK. And um, and so a lot of times we make bad decisions in our lives, our guardian angels and God is still with us. Right. And so they don't mess with our free, free will. One thing that you always hear stories about guardian angels coming to us, especially when we are in need. You hear about this all the time. 
about somebody has fallen asleep at the wheel and you know what I mean? And then all at once they, you know, they're kind of I mean, they're drowsy, they fall asleep possibly, and something takes over the wheel, right? The person wakes up and it's like, oh my God, they could have been killed. You know what I mean? And so I believe our, I believe at times that our guardian angel uh, will, you know, will intervene and assist us and to help us. Okay. And like I said, our guardian angels and all angels are around us all the time, you know, and, you know, like I said, in my experience, the angels are always with me. I rely on them 24 seven for assistance and for help. And a lot of times, uh, a lot of times we don't want to listen to them because we think that we can do it on our own. We think that we know best. Right. And a lot of times we need to listen to our guardian angels. And in doing so, they will never lead us astray. Never. OK, uh, they are there to assist us. They are there to help us and such like that. And I know that there are, like I said, there are many, many angels who are in the disguise of poor people. Street people, uh, people who are living in homeless shelters, going to soup kitchens. Maybe you'll see them on the streets just sitting, you know, and and when I walk and my spirit will urge me if I if, if I walk by someone who's sitting on the street corner or sitting by a 7-Eleven or a Casey's or whatever type of little mini mart and they're just sitting there. And I acknowledge who they are, even if I don't have a dollar to give them, right? So what we can do is that we can acknowledge them. Hi, how are you doing today? You know, um, and those types of things, you know. And, um, and that's one thing that Mother Teresa of Calcutta said, that we need to acknowledge our brothers and sisters. If they're, if they're, if they're living in rags, as she said one time, or if they're wearing a $10,000 suit, okay? So we need to acknowledge, sometimes that when we see somebody <clears throat> and your spirit urges you to smile at them, smile. Maybe they're having a bad time. You know, maybe they're having a bad time that very moment. Maybe they're um, having a bad time in their life and such like that. And so if one would just smile at them, um, a smile can change someone's life immediately. If someone is contemplating suicide, we may not know that, right? But we can sense or feel maybe something's wrong, and if you just smile at them, that smile can change their life completely, you yeah, know? And, and even if you're wearing a mask, you know, they can see it in your eyes when you smile. And my daughter right. and I were having a conversation like this the other day. She's 17, and um, a lot of times there will be homeless people there at the stop sign when you're leaving Walmart and stuff. and. Um, she was talking about, you know, how awkward sometimes it makes her feel and, and she'll divert her attention or look away or whatnot. And and I was saying to her, you know, a lot of times they just need that acknowledgement or to feel human because so many people look down on them and, you know, treat right. them roughly and they just need to, you know, a smile and wave or if you're walking past, like you said, say hello, how's your day or whatnot. It right. really does um, help, I, I believe. It does very much so. So if we can acknowledge our brothers and sisters like that, you know what I mean? Because acknowledge them, um, acknowledge them then um, that they are a human being, that they are not, you know, that they, you know, like I said, they're having a rough day possibly. And, um, and so just smiling at them, saying hello to them. I must, I have never said this to anyone before. But many, 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 many years ago, I was very, uh, this was probably when I was in my late 20s, 30s, living in Florida. And I had almost everything. And so it's like that, right? This gentleman, and it was a hot day, a hot day. And I am ashamed of what had transpired. And I will tell everyone that, um, it was hot and I had the water hose out there and this gentleman comes up very, very hot day. And as I look back immediately when I did not respond to him appropriately, I thought he was an angel, you know, and um, 
he, this is, I'm embarrassed and ashamed, but I learned by this and that he asked me for a glass of water. And here I had a damn hose in my hand running water, right? And I said, I didn't have any. And it was like, oh my God. And immediately when I said that, as Pentecostal Christians would say that I was convicted by the spirit. And it, I, you know what? I felt horrible. I felt horrible. And, um, and so I ran inside was, and got some ice, had a cup. I went looking for him. It was a guy. And I couldn't find him. And he wasn't walking that fast at all. Okay. And I refused him a glass of water, ice water, regular water, right? And I will never forget that. And this is the first time that I've talked about this, that I didn't show compassion. I was just thinking of myself. But the minute that, and the minute that I said that to him, I was convicted, as they say, right? It was like my spirit saying, Robert, really? Yeah, you, you imme- a- immediately realized. <laughs> yeah, I did. And maybe I was supposed to learn that. Maybe I was. And, you know, and, and so I'm glad that I did. But I did go looking for him. I went looking for him. He wasn't walking that fast. I was in my house maybe 30 seconds to a minute of that. I looked all over for him. And he was nowhere to be found. And I cried like a baby because I knew then that I was being tested and I failed miserably. I failed miserably, but I learned by that experience. I learned by that experience, you know? And so just from that experience is that now, um, if somebody asks me for something or I will just volunteer it, right? Um, that you never know if it is an angel or maybe Jesus himself, you know? And um, and so I did in my heart immediately after trying to find this gentleman, but immediately I said, oh, my, please forgive me. Forgive me for being so stupid. You know, forgive me for being so arrogant, you know? And um, so do I believe that gentleman was an angel? I do. Because he wasn't walking very fast, like I said, and he was just going down, you know, my street and everything. And, um, and I cannot, I could not find him. Not at all. Not at all. Um, but I learned by that experience. I did. You know, I learned by that. You know, and, you know, and there's so many lessons in life that we have to learn. And that was one that I needed to learn. And it's not that I was not a giving person prior to that, right? But I don't know on this day, it was like I was just thinking of myself. And I usually just don't think of myself, you know what I mean? And so it was just weird. I don't know. Um, But I do know that that changed my life. It really changed my life completely. Um, And so then when I see somebody, like I was in, I was in Nebraska, um, and I volunteer there also in a very small town that has a soup kitchen and a homeless shelter. And I go there quite often. And people will come up to me and such like that. Now, you think in the state of Nebraska that there wouldn't be a lot of homeless people or people who need groceries and that type of thing, right? And uh, But this town in which I'm speaking of is very close to Interstate 80. Okay, so a lot of people come off the interstate and looking for something because there's a big sign, homeless, shelter, soup kitchen, and such like that, right? And um, um, and so we get a lot of people coming in from all over the country and such like that. And uh, so, and we're open uh, six days, the place is open six days a week. And, and um, so if someone needs something, I try to do my best to give it to them. Also, when I was in New Mexico and the homeless shelter and soup kitchen was just right off of Interstate uh, 40, 
okay? And uh, so we would get people who needed assistance and such like that. So we tried to help them as much as what we could, okay? Uh, but again, we all fall short of the glory of God. We all, fall, we all fall short of the universe. We do. You know, we're human beings. We do things that we're ashamed of. We do things um, that we need to learn the lesson about. And so in that instant, I learned. And so now when I see someone that, you know, um, I was in Lincoln, Nebraska, and um, and my friends and I had stopped by a, um, a mini mart, like a Casey's or something. And there was a gentleman that was sitting on, sitting right next to the door, a very hot day. He didn't have a sign or anything like that. But I looked at him and I said, you know, I said hi to him and me and me and and he put out his hand and such like that. And so I shook his hand. Um, but prior to that, I just noticed people just going by him and not saying anything. Now, could you could, could you imagine, Tessa and my friends and my brothers and sisters who are listening to this, that if that was you sitting there? You know, by a min, you know, by the doors of a mini mart or Casey's or whatever, right? And you're sitting there, and all these people pass you. How would that make you feel? Yeah, you, you feel know? dehumanized, and right, it's right. just crazy how a lot of people treat the homeless. You don't know how they got there. They just automatically assume this person's a drug a drug addict or whatever. Um, there's so right. many different stories behind why people are homeless. And it's not right. for us to judge, you know. Amen. That's very, very true. So I stopped. Of course, my friends wanted me to come on and such like that, but they know that I do this. They know that I take the time and just acknowledge. And I asked him if he wanted something to drink, and he said, yes, please. And uh, so I went in and got him something to drink. And plus, I got him some other, I got some chips and a sandwich for him and that type of thing, right? And again, I'm not telling my experiences that I want to pat on the back. No, that's not it at all. Because I think that I believe that we're all brothers and sisters in this universe and we need to help each other if we can. Okay. And uh, so I did. And, um, and so my friends are kind of used that used to that now that if I see someone sitting by the door or something like that, you know, and stuff like that, that I will stop and talk with them. Okay. Um, Another thing that I do, and again, I don't, Tessa, I really don't like to really tell of like the things that I do to help our brothers and sisters. And again, in the Bible talks about don't let your left hand know what your right one is doing. It's a very, you know, and the Jewish and, and so, and so our Jewish brothers and sisters believe that also. Um, but I know that, you know, you know, Salvation Army, they're bell ringers, right? And if you mm -hmm. live in a sick, Colorado or anywhere where it gets cold, you know, during the winter time, you know, those folks are cold. They have to be cold, right? Yes. Some of them volunteers or other people are making a couple bucks an hour, whatever it is, but that doesn't matter to me. That I will ask, I will ask the bell ringer if they want a hot cup of coffee or if they're in need of a sandwich and such like that. A lot of times they say, yes, please. Or they'll say, no, it's okay, but you can tell them their voice that, that they would, you know? And so if they say no, I go to McDonald's or wherever I'm at and go get them a hot cup of coffee or a hot chocolate and I'll get them a sandwich also, you know? And um, because I want to show other people this is what, maybe nobody thought about that. Maybe nobody thought about, you know, getting a hot cup of coffee or a hot chocolate for, <clears throat> for um, a, you know, a Salvation Army bell ringer and such like that, right? And so by my experience, I hope that, I, that other people will see, oh, look, look what he's doing. I've never seen that before, right? And maybe that it will instill in them or maybe, or at least they will think about it, you know? Yeah, and I was going to um, say that about um, when you do help other people, like, giving to the homeless or um like we discussed right now you know the salvation army bell ringer um it is not tooting your own horn or bragging but it's inspirational and when people see you do that or uh, hear about it or whatnot it could inspire them to do it as well so i think it's a good thing to share mm, 
done well. Thank you. It just, I, I don't know. It just, it just takes my humility away. You know what I mean? But you know, but but you are right to share this experience with others. Um, maybe nobody's ever thought about doing that before. You know, and uh, so maybe that I have instilled in them maybe to do something or maybe they do something you know maybe they do it already it's not for me to say right um but again when i do things like that i don't make a lot of fuss about it i just go and do it um and then i hand it to them and then i just walk away you know and such like that and um and working with the homeless and just like you said tessa that we don't know why they're homeless it's none of our business it's none of our affair why they're homeless, unless they want to talk about it. You know, I volunteer, you know, <clears throat> almost every day at a homeless shelter in Soup Kitchen. And I don't ask why they come to us. It's not important to me, you know, unless they want to talk about it, right? And so they, you know, and so some of them will say and others won't. And that's fine. And that's fine. But they came in for a meal and meal they will receive. Okay. Here in Illinois, we have just received two weeks of a horrible major ice and snowstorm oh, wow. last week. And then a couple of days ago, we had another one. And next Thursday and Friday, we're going to have another snowstorm. Okay. And, um, and I know that, of course, that we knew that the snowstorm was coming, right? And, uh, the soup kitchen was going to be closed. The shelter, which is where I'm at, where I volunteer, is for women and children. So that's open 24-7, right? And, uh, but the soup kitchen is, um, is only open five days a week. But what I do when there's a pending storm is that, okay, like it was like Wednesday and Thursday, uh, like the first one two weeks ago was like Wednesday and Thursday. We knew it was coming. Uh, lots of ice, lots of snow, and we knew that we were going to be closed at least those two days and then also Friday. So what I did was that I made extra sandwiches besides the meal that we had, right? And so everybody got extra sandwiches to take home with them. Um, we had uh, frozen dinners to give to them also and such like that so they could put them in a microwave, Okay. Uh, the people that come to this shelter or come to this uh, soup kitchen, they all have homes. They not they, you know, and uh, but but it's just the fact that some people use their food stamps wisely and other people's don't. But again, it's not for me to judge how they use their food stamps. You know, they come into us, they come into the soup kitchen, and um, and you know, and they're there to eat there there to talk with other folks and such like that. And so we do. And so I always make sure, I always make sure that there, if there is going to be a pending storm, uh, that people have lots of food to take home with them just in case that we're not open and such like that. Right. And, um, uh, because it's very, very important, you know, and again, I don't ask them if they have food stamps. It's none of my affair. It's not, you know, these people, the, the folks that come to us, like a lot of soup kitchens, they are the working poor. You know what I mean? They just, you know, they have jobs that maybe don't pay a lot. Maybe their rent is high and such like that. Again, I don't know uh, for a lot of these folks, but it doesn't matter. They came in for a meal. And so we're there to feed to feed the physical part of them, but also the spiritual and also the emotional part. To sit down and take time with them and to talk with them, you know? And so whereas the sip kitchen um, opens up, we open up about 11.15. And if it's really, really cold, like below zero or something like that, uh, we always open two hours early so they can come in, have a nice hot cup of coffee, uh, sit at the table, um, and then I will serve them some snacks and such, you know, before the main meal. So they can come in and they can talk, you know, a lot of these homeless people know each other. You know, and I and I really shouldn't say homeless <clears throat> because they are very self, very few of them are truly homeless. They do have homes, but they just need food. OK, and um, and so they come in and uh, they will sit down and chit chat. And they're very, very pleasant to me, um, asking me what we're going to have for the day and such like that. And I tell them and 
I always make sure that we have something hot. And when I say a soup kitchen, we just don't have soup. We don't. Uh, last week, we had pork loin, mashed potatoes, gravy, corn, and, that, and those types of things, right? I always try to give them some types of sweets also, okay? Sometimes during the summertime, we'll have ice cream and such like that, right? And um, and so I try to be there for them in every way that I can, you know? And even when I'm, even when we're having a rough day, just imagine what our brothers and sisters are going through, you know? So our roughest day may be a day of joy to them. You know what I mean? Because we don't know, we don't know what rough days they are having. And I don't ask if someone wants to talk to me. I'm very open to that. But again, I do not pry into one's business either. I am there to show them love, to show them compassion, okay? And um, and just like in New Mexico, um, you know, working with our Native American brothers and sisters, and um, a lot of them were drunk when they came in and such like that. And even with all that, that we, that we're all brothers and sisters, I don't, you know, we should never judge why they drink. You know what I mean? We should never judge that. Uh, They came to us for a specific reason. And so we're going to take care of their physical needs as well as their emotional and spiritual needs, if all possible, right? And and so, like I said, it doesn't have to be monumental. But just like a smile can change their, it can change their entire outlook. You know, for that very, for that, for that, for those very minute seconds that someone smiled at them. Someone acknowledged me. Somebody gave me hope and maybe they don't, you know what I mean? You know, so to give them hope uh, and tell them that they are loved. And you don't have to say, well, I love you, but, you know, by just smiling at them. Smiling at them shows talking with them, talking to our brothers and sisters, excuse me, talking with our brothers and sisters, um, it changes their lives, you know? I may never see that person again. That person could be an angel. I don't know, you know? Um, And so I may never see that person again in this lifetime, but sometime in the next lifetime, I'm sure that we will, that I will, you know? Um, A lot of times my brothers and sisters who are listening to this, it's much easier to be nice to a homeless person on the streets. But sometimes it's most difficult to be nice to our loved ones. You know what I mean? Um, You know, I know a lot of families now are just tore apart because of this COVID thing. You know, America is being so divided. You know, should the state be doing this? Should the state be doing that? You know, mandating masks and stuff like that. Finally, here in the state of Illinois, the governor has lifted that. The governor has lifted the mandate on masks. Now it's optional. You know, and um, yeah, and well, it's supposed to take place on the 28th of this month, but um, it's getting relaxed by the day it is. And, uh, you know, people have had enough, you know, we're social beings, right? We need to see smiles. We need to see people's faces. We do. You know, um, we have within the past three years of this COVID it has really changed America a lot. I think that what has happened, what has transpired, um, we may not feel the effects of it now, but later on down the road, I think that we will, because I think we raised children during this pandemic in a not very good way. You know, children, because they're social beings, right? And so we need we need to hang out with our friends. Children need to play with other children. Senior citizens should never be stuck in a home, you know what I mean, where they cannot at least see their loved ones. They mm-hmm. can't go outside and do those types of things, you know? Yeah. Um, and so I think maybe in 50 years, maybe 100 years, I don't know, I could be wrong, that I think that the next generation or generations down the road, 50 or 60 years from now, are going to say that those people handled the COVID pandemic terribly. 
I think we're going to be judged terribly in how we handled it and how we, um, I don't want to get real political, not at all, but it's just the fact, I think that people, people, people folded up too quickly. The Christian churches folded up quickly. You know what I mean? Yeah. Churches were closed, you know, and, you know, there's always a separation of church and state. You know, during the Spanish flu, okay, no churches were closed. None of them were. You know what I mean? Uh, and, you know, uh, were, were masks mandated? No. And such like that, right? But anyhow, that was a different time. But. I, but it just, it seems so strange that the churches would be closed of all places. Some of them are closed, right? And the other ones that weren't closed, I know that they was, there was a lot of pressure. Yeah, from the, the and people Lord. were getting arrested, too, for doing it. Right. right. And I know personally <clears throat> that when the COVID just hit in the spring, that I went to Good Friday services at three o'clock at my Catholic church and the doors were locked, but there were people inside. That's you know, weird. There was, I know the priest was inside with about five other people and I wanted to come in there because of Good Friday services, right? And they said I could not come in because of COVID. And it's like, oh my God, you're kidding me. You know, so I prayed, I prayed outside the doors and such like that. And I, um, um, and that changed my thinking a lot. It really, really did. I was hurt, but there was a lesson in that in life also for me that one should never take our churches for granted. If you go to church, you know what I mean? You know, and um, and also in my mind, I was thinking, well, what about this te- separation of church and state? You know what I mean? Yeah. And so that came to mind also. And um, but the churches just folded like early on. But now everyone is standing up and saying enough is enough, you know. And um, but um, anyhow, there are angels around us all the time. And like I said. That was the number one question that I get all the time about angels. Are there demons? Yes. A lot of the demons that we're talking about are the demons that chase us. There are our own, our own demons, if that makes sense. It could be the demon of uh, pornography, or it could be the demon of all sorts of things. You know what I mean? You know, and such like that. Um, and, you know, I know within the paranormal field, there are many, many people believe that everything is demonic. Well, it's not. It's not. It's only maybe a, a small percentage. Yeah, very of what few. We're, yes. You know, but the first thing, and I think that has a lot to do with the TV shows on TV. You know what I mean? I think that has a lot to do with it. And, uh, <clears throat> and such like that. So people really need to kind of step back and really look at what's going on and such like that, you know. Do I believe that there are demons out there? Yes, I do, very much so, you know. And and but it's not like it's not like they're there twenty four seven. You know what I mean? It's not like there's like ten million or ten zillion. You know what I mean? Not everything is demonic. It isn't. And um, and so people have to go in with an open mind and such like that, right? I know that. Um, it was September uh, several years ago uh, that some friends of mine invited me to go to the Valeska Axe Murder House in Iowa. Mm-hmm. <coughs> Excuse me. And so we did. We spent we spent 24 hours. It was overnight, and it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if it was day or night, right? Right. It, it, okay, because spirits are around us 24 seven. You don't have, you know, this thing about the nighttime and, it, you know, the nighttime is, you know, with that, I think we're, I think a lot of people within the paranormal field are fixated with, with only have to at night, you know, and, you know, and, and really the spirits are around is 24-7. Right. They are. Yeah, but I think what some I, of the uh, night thing is, you know, depending on where you live, 
it's a lot quieter, so you don't get a lot of sound uh, interruption. But yeah, one of my best uh, investigations was, you know, we went there at 8.30 in the morning, which I really hate mornings, but it was so active, it, it really blew my mind. But yeah, they are around all the time. Wow. Okay, um, um, Tessa, can you just briefly talk about your experience in the daytime then with, with, that, with that experience? Yeah, we had gone to the... Um, the Durango Silverton Narrow Gauge Railroad Museum in Durango, Colorado, and um, we went back there to do a preliminary investigation, and it was a train car that was known as the immigrant car, and uh, there was a ghost that was in there named, well, they thought her name was Emmy, which Emmy is one of the ghosts that are there. She's a little girl ghost. Uh, we found uh -huh. out that day um, through our equipment that um, her name was Kate Johnson, uh, and she talked kind of about the whole story, Walter Intention, Death, Sharp Tool. Um, she had been on that train car. She eloped uh, with her fiancé. She was a soiled dove, but they fell in love and were going to elope and get married. And mm -hmm. her being a working girl, the brakeman had found them together and did stab her fiancé to death. So um, wow. later on, she did end up taking her own life, and I think she was kind of stuck there because that was... The root of why she did it it was kind of like her purgatory or whatever going on um mm -hmm. but there was a catholic school class that came in later on and and it's so awesome that we did get her name because that's pretty important as far as blessings and prayers and such go and release meant and uh mm -hmm. this catholic school mm -hmm. class did a prayer of release from purgatory which a lot of people haven't heard of um and she was gone for like three months but like you're saying due to free will free agency she came back to protect Emmy because Walter the Brakeman was there too. Um, I, but yeah, so active there. It's giving me goosebumps right now just thinking about it. But um, it was yeah. really amazing and awesome how, how well she did come through. Right. And so again, my brothers and sisters who are listening to this, it doesn't have to be at nighttime. And I understand people work during the day. And I understand that. Uh, but, a, but a lot of times people will wait till it gets dark. And that's just the... That just makes the creepy part. You know what I mean? You know, and um, and so I understand that. You know, and I always tell people like another question people ask me is, I am fearful, or people are fearful, right? And I try to explain to them that it's not getting over the fear; it is understanding the fear. What are you afraid of? And I, and by understanding the fear and understanding and realizing that the fear is inside you. Why are you fearful? And if people would just, just stop and think about that, the fear will never go away, but it will subside some. You know what I mean? You know, and be, because physically, we will react to fear. We get goosebumps, right? We get, you know, our adrenaline is pumped up. It is just like fight or flight, you know? And, you know, and so just think about that. I've heard many of a paranormal brothers and sisters running out of a building because they were so scared. And, you know, and God bless them. You know, they would just, you know, they they thought they had to get out of there. But again, it you know, but again, it's understanding the fear. What are you fearful of? Are you fearful that these spirits are going to hurt you physically? And my, in my experience, after all these years, it's very, very seldom. I mean, they may touch you, they may pull your hair, and we can go into that later on, especially in, institu in institutions and such, right? But it's just the fact a lot of times they want to be, they want their story to be told. And again, it's very hard for a spirit to talk because they don't have a diaphragm. They don't. You know what I mean? And so it's very hard for them, you know, and a lot of times we have to realize that when we go into any, any house, residential, or go into a state of silence or whatever, that we must realize that all that energy from anybody else who's been in there, especially in state institutions and such, right, uh, that all that energy in there that's been imprinted in there, right? And... Um, and so, but just think about and learn about the history of these places, 
you know, I've been in many state hospitals when they were still very active. You know, they were running, right? And so I know and I saw firsthand how our brothers and sisters were treated in these state asylums and state hospitals and such. And it wasn't pleasant. It wasn't nice. It was inhumane how these folks were treated. It was horrible, horrible situation. These people never wanted to be there. They were left there a lot of times as babies, as young adults, as young children, you know, and stuff like that, you know, you know. And so, so one must realize that we need to find out about the history and what went on within these places, you know. Um, yeah, and I like to go in um, generally the first time somewhere cold, not knowing, um, and uh-huh. seeing what I pick up, and then doing the right. uh, investigation into, like you said, the history because it's amazing the things that do pop up, whether it's residual or intelligent. It's it's pretty awesome. Right. It is, you know. And a lot of times when I go in, I go in cold also, right? But when it comes to these state institutions of where I worked at these different places, and several of many of them, uh, five different ones in my lifetime when I was younger and such, and um, and just ex- and what I experienced in these houses really of torture, really, um, and just understanding of what. Uh, per, what our poor brothers and sisters went through, it wasn't nice at all. It was horrible. It was horrifying and such like that. And again, and again, God made us to be social beings. And but to be around 150 people who, let's say that they are mentally ill, and maybe that when we were dropped off there, maybe as children, that we were not mentally ill. But because of some reason, the parents just dropped us off there, right? Well, before you know it, we become mentally ill ourselves, okay? And being social animals, we need that human touch, a, a loving touch, not a slap, not, not having your hair pulled, nothing like that. But being social animals, we need, we need that human touch to survive and such like that. Um, and so I tell my brothers and sisters, when they go into these institutions, be very compassionate of what our brothers and sisters have gone through in those places. They were horrifying places. They were. They were not pleasant. They were not nice at all. Yeah, it's what pretty I horrific what happens there. And then um, I was watching a show this last week, uh, The Foreman Brothers, and it was before they became really big. It was one of their original ones. And. Uh, they were talking about, well, so-and-so's grandma worked there, and she said she went, too, and the only thing that made her uncomfortable was that she was around a bunch of disabled kids and stuff, and, and it was kind of weird to her, but she didn't witness anything bad. Well, of course, you know, she's probably sitting in an office or off to the side or something somewhere. She's not on all floors. She's not witnessing everything because there was um, right. a bunch of dysfunction abuse. and abuse and mistreatment going on mm-hmm. in there. Um, she just wasn't right. really privy to it. And I think that right. does, does stick. It does last and hang around there. It does, you know, because the energy is imprinted in those buildings. Very much so. And when I hear, and I don't watch these shows anymore because they just drive me nuts. But um, it does the fact when people go in and try to provoke. That's just, that's just wrong. That's just like me coming into your house and provoking. You know what I mean? People should not do that. Yeah, just because they're on the other side doesn't mean they're not people too. Because they are just like you and me. They just are without a body at the at the moment. Right. You know, and they want their story to be told. But again, if they're mentally ill or if they're mentally challenged, how can how are they able to tell their story? They're not at times. And so when people get their hair pulled or maybe they get scratched. It's not that the spirits are doing it to be mean or malicious. It's just the fact they want your attention, and that's how they got attention or try to Mm -hmm. um, institutions. You know, I know firsthand of being in these institutions and experiencing what I did. Many a time I went to the superintendent. You know, when, when you go into a state asylum, 
like I have, like in Iowa and different places, and you see the abuse and emotional abuse as well as physical abuse. I went to a superintendent or went to my supervisor many times and said, listen, this is what's going on. We need to, you know, you folks need to stop this. And the superintendent goes, Robert, you are correct. There is a lot of abuse going on. But I remember one superintendent said, saying to me, this is what has happened for the past hundred years. It's not going to change tomorrow. Why? And I thought that. <laughs> and, and I thought that, and I thought that was a shitty attitude. It was horrible, you know. Yeah, it just I know takes that, one person to start the ball rolling as far as change, you know. I know that one time, it was in Iowa, and I was there for six months, and I was assigned to um, a ward. They call them wards or units back then, right? And the state hospital had over 3,000 people, human beings, right? And so I was on, I was on um, the first shift. There was 100, 150 men on one floor, and there was like three floors, right? 150 men, and there was only four workers, okay? We were called child development workers. These were not children. These were adults. Some of them had the mind of a child, right? Okay. And the way, you know, when you have four workers for 150 people, it, I know people get frustrated. The pay back then was not, it was not good at all. It wasn't. I know before I, I, um, I heard of stories of people who had worked there for 30, 40 years, right? Sometimes the state didn't have any money to pay them, so they paid them in beans or corn, you know? And um, I think one of the most horrifying things that I saw, I saw many horrifying things, but one of them was that the supervisor, who was very, very loving, she said, Robert, today we're going to, um, everyone's going to get some popcorn today. I thought, well, you know, that's great. And so now I, I said, where are the bowls so we can start making the popcorn? And he goes, Robert, we do not use bowls. She goes, she, she told me that somebody, someone will put a sheet down on the floor. And I was horrifying when I saw, I was horrified when I saw this, is that, <clears throat> is that um, the, pop, the popcorn was made, the sheet was put down, and you should have seen our brothers and sisters scrambling like animals to this popcorn. I that um, I will never get that out of my mind. Never. Kind of reminds you of uh, pigs being fed slop or whatever, like that. I don't know, just another, mm -hmm. another right. corner to cut. How much are bowls? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, right. You know, and also that when they wanted to go outside, they were tethered together. They were tied with ropes one to another. So they wouldn't escape. Wow. That's not that's not fun being outside like that. No. Not at all, you know. Your free time is you not free. <laughs> right. It's not. You know you know, granted, when there's four workers and you have to, you know, feed them breakfast, get breakfast ready and such like that. And a lot of the people a lot of the uh, the units that I was on or the wards as they call them that they did not go to the dining room, that the meals were brought to them by these tunnels. Oh my God, they had miles and miles of tunnels that led to like the med center or the infirmary um, or to the morgue, um, you know, or, for, or to the cafeteria. So the meals would be brought to us, right? And so a lot of our brothers and sisters were not able to feed themselves you know, and so they would just put the meals down in front of them and then walk away. And these people were hungry. Not so sad. So think about, so think about when you have four workers there, right? We had to bathe them in the morning. We had to feed them in the morning. Um, you know, and then and then at lunchtime and such like that, right? A snack in the afternoon, and. Four workers and 150 
of our brothers and sisters. <clears throat> it was difficult at best. It was. Definitely. And so a lot of these people, a lot of these people, a lot of them were ne never given utensils. Never. Mm -hmm. They had to eat with their finger and such like that. We had a lot of people that uh, were suffering from pica, which is pica is um, is a syndrome or disease that they will eat anything, nails, glass, anything like that, right? And so one had to be very, very careful. Yeah, drywall, you know? dirt, so, but anything. Just trying to, oh, anything, their own feces, mm. uh, drink their own urine. Some of them were in... Um, Back then, they just said diapers. You know what I mean? Um, and the smell was horrendous. It was. No air conditioning in these buildings. Okay? And um, and so the windows, especially during the summertime in Iowa, it's very, very hot and humid. Very hot and humid. And so there was no fans in there whatsoever. You know what I mean? And uh, But just trying to... I tried to help them as much as I could, you know, but yeah. even with that, I was restrained doing a lot of things. And uh, that opened my eyes so much. I remember that um, on my days off, I had like Sunday, Monday off, right? And so what I would do, I lived right on, I lived right on the property. There was a big brick, brick building uh, for people who came to work there from out of state, right? Mm -hmm. And so I lived in called employee housing, which at one time housed our brothers and sisters, right? right. But the state had come in and put nice, nice bedrooms and everything. We had our own kitchen and stuff like that. We had our own shower, right? <clears throat> and um, so on my days off, uh, the closest big town was Des Moines, and that was like 50 miles south. Mm -hmm. of where I was at. And so basically, I just walked around the state grounds during the day when I had my day off and such. And But at night, I would go down into the tunnels. And what I experienced there, the tunnels were... Well, I'm going to cut you off right were, there because we do have to go yeah. to our first music break. But I, I'm super excited okay. to hear about that. Um, mm -hmm. So on this break, we have Mr. Brick Casey from Boston, and he's going to be singing Mr. Selman. We have Nonye Toria from Ghana, South Africa. She's going to be singing Gabon as well as Kaki. And then we have King Cinnamon from Biafra, Nigeria, and he will be singing Fantastic. You guys don't go anywhere. We'll be right back after this music break. Hello? I'm trying to call my baby buddy. Usually in the mall, maybe something wrong. I mean, she 
wouldn't take this long to call back. See, be tight like that. She's supposed to be mine. So could you please try it one more time? Hey, Mr. Sailor Phone Man, I see there's something wrong with my line. I try to dial my baby's number, but get click every time. Mr. Sailor Phone Man, I see there's something wrong with my line. I try to dial my baby's number, but get click every time. Oh yeah, make you move your body 
Welcome back, and thank you so much for joining us this evening on We Are Paradox Media's Late Night in the Rockies. I'm your host, Tessa TNT, and we have an awesome guest this evening, Mr. Robert Rigi. Um, Thank you so much for coming and sharing your stories with us tonight, Robert. It's been awesome. Well, thank you so very much for having me on. I appreciate you so very, very much, my dear friend. And for everyone who is listening, welcome, welcome. Yes, and we well, have a, a new listener and a person in chat, and she uh, shared her story earlier when we were talking about homelessness and such, and she said it's her first time listening. Uh, her name is mm-hmm. Jemima, and she's from the UK, and she was homeless when she was younger. She's not ashamed of her past. It's led her to be the person that she is today. She had a mm. drug problem, and life went to shit. She got clean, had a son, and grew up. Now she's just addicted to the search for knowledge and truth about everything extraterrestrial. And she's looking forward Mm -hmm. to being a part of this community. And I just thought it was really awesome that she came across the show uh, this evening in particular. Well, welcome, Jemima. Welcome, welcome, welcome. And you know what? That, um, That we should never judge at any time. But especially... For our brothers and sisters who are in homeless shelters, 
we don't know what's going on in their lives. You know, granted, do we make bad decisions? Of course we do. You know what I mean? Uh, but, but to learn by those decisions. Sometimes people end up at a homeless shelter um, or on the streets, not, not because they have done anything. A lot of times, people who come into our lives, the people who we have allowed to come in our lives have set us up and have used us and abused us. Mm-hmm. Exactly. You know? you know, and uh, so we all need to take time. And Jemima, I'm very, very proud of you. Very, very proud. I know it was a struggle, you know, and um, and uh, praise God that you're doing beautifully now, you know, and your thirst for knowledge is wonderful. Your thirst for knowledge is not coming from a bottle or from drugs or anything like that. Um, but you have, and just like what Jemima said, which is very true, that sometimes we have to go through these experiences, all these horrible, ugly experiences to find out who we are, you know, and that, and that is a process. And for me personally, I find out something new about myself almost every day. Right. You know? You know, and so life is a process. We are never told that life is going to be easy because it's not. We see all these billionaires with everything they have. I'm sure that there's a percentage that are very happy, uh, you know, and they're probably, you know, give a lot of their money away and they volunteer and stuff like that. And God bless them. But money and material things doesn't bring happiness. It doesn't bring love, you know. And um, and so, again, we should never judge anyone who is homeless, living in a shelter or um, living on the streets because we don't know what their story is. We don't know what they are experiencing. Yeah. And so it's like, for know. me, um, I became homeless, like you said, uh, to escape an abusive relationship. I'd rather be living in my car than, you know, living there and being abused. And it was me and my my daughter and. Luckily, it was mm-hmm. only a couple months, but still, you know, there's mm-hmm. different reasons that we're out there. We'd rather do that than than face that torment or torture or abuse or whatever else, you know. Right. As, you know, especially when there's children involved, you know, because if a person doesn't get out, and I understand that a lot of pe- people feel they're stuck, and I understand that totally. I do. But to have children involved to see what we're going through, you know, that that will that will scar them many times for life. You know what I mean? And um and but Jemima, I'm very, very proud of you. Me very, too. very proud. Good job, you know, sister. And, yes, very much so. And uh so I will pray for you, Jemima, that you keep on this journey of finding more things out about yourself. And um, and such like that. So I'm very, very proud of you, Jemima. And thank you for listening. Thank you. Um, but going back to... The tunnels. Um, <laughs> the tunnels, yes. And so on my days off, I had Sunday and Monday off, which are really not the greatest days to have off. Really, they're not. But, um, but anyhow, um, so my shift ended at 3 o'clock, like on a Saturday, right? And uh, so I was, you know, free until really too early Tuesday morning. Had to be work at six. And um, but anyhow, so I remember that on one Saturday that I had gone back to the employees um, housing, which was very nice compared to what our brothers and sisters were living in. And um, and I thought to myself, I can get into these tunnels because they were open. You know, I had, I, we had, we all had keys and such like that. Uh, we all had uh, name tags, you know, that we wore around our necks and such like that, right? And so a lot of the security knew who we were and such like that. So there was no problem. So there is a tunnel leading from the employees of housing. And uh, because at one time, like I said, that it was housing for patients there, okay? And anyhow, so I decided just to go down into the sub basement. It was, there was like a basement and then you go down probably 10 uh, steps, 15, whatever it was, and went into a sub basement 
And then you walk a little ways and then the, you unlock the door and there is a tunnel. And the tunnel had signs in it, I remember, of where, like, to the morgue, to the infirmary, um, you know, and those types of things in different places. And so I decided to investigate. I decided to in investigate for myself, right? And so, again, it was like 9 o'clock at night. And um, but just going down there, you know, like I said, the lights were literally dim, uh, were dimmed, and um, and the lights were maybe oh, I, I would say maybe a hundred feet apart, maybe two hundred. So it wasn't like the whole tunnel was, was was lit up, right? And so I thought, you know, I wanted to go to the morgue, and how I got there. In fact, in fact, I got lost within this tunnel system. Oh no! I did. <laughs> I got totally lost. I did have a flashlight back then. There were no cell phones, of course. And um, but anyhow, I had a flashlight with me, and um, I really, after two hours, I ended up in the morgue. Okay, so we're talking like 1974, 75. 76 in that era, right? And the state hospitals were just really going gangbusters then, you know? And um, I just remember going there and I remember hearing things, like hearing screams. Felt like I felt that somebody was walking behind me or with me. I felt their presence, okay? And did I get scared? Yes, because it's a human emotion, but I wanted to experience that. You know, um, I was pushed. But just being down in those tunnels and went to the morgue and to see what a morgue within the state hospital system looks like, it was just horrifying. And I said, I know that I have said that word many times, but it's true. Sometimes, my brothers and sisters, you just can't find the words. You know, was it heinous, hideous? Yes. Was it creepy? Yes. You know what I mean? And um, and when I walked through the door to go into the morgue, it was very cold. But again, it was way, way below the surface. You know what I mean? <clears throat> and so, of course, it would be cooler there. And I just remember seeing all these refrigerators and such like that. And um, I remember opening one of them, and there were there were bodies in there. There were bodies in there, and they were going to be buried. I don't know when, um, but again, when there's three thousand patients, you know, of our brothers and sisters on an institution like that. Uh, that I didn't know who these people were, but I just knew that they were someone's brother or sister. You know what I mean? Uh, yeah. Someone's uh, and such like that. And they were just laying there. And um, but again, I when I walked in there, the smell was just it was just overbearing. The smell of death. And the closer I got to the morgue area. Um, it was, the smell just got worse and worse and worse. Now, one has to understand that these uh, brothers and sisters, when someone died within the state system, maybe one out of a hundred, maybe their loved ones came and got them. But a lot of times the state just buried them and they did not embalm them, not at all. They couldn't use any embalming fluid. And a lot of them, of course, had autopsies, but they were done horribly. You know, even with a dead, you know, even with the person deceased, um, that was horrifying to me to see how they were just kind of ripped open and such like that. Yeah. And being Roman Catholic, I did pray. Did I see shadows? Yes. Did I hear things within the morgue itself? Yes. Um, it sounded like someone was walking down the hall. And I knew, knew there was no one there but me. Nobody else was there. And, um, and, and, and again, I thought, well, I can't run because here I am within this maze of tunnels, right? Where am I going to run to? I mean, it would, you know what I mean? It would take me a long time. 
And so I thought, you know what? I'm there to experience what I'm going to experience. And uh, so I did. Uh, there were five people, five of our brothers and sisters in these refrigerators and such. And uh, so I said a prayer at their side, each of them, and praying that praying that God would um, pass them over, you know, not pass them over, but, you know, but pass them on to another life, you know. And um, but again, just being down there, I was probably in the morgue maybe half an hour. I looked at the in- instruments they were, you know, they had used and such like that. And, you know, a lot of them during that state system and such that the doctors, psychiatrists, scientists were fascinated with the brain. So a lot of them, they yeah. had, you know, a lot of them had different body parts and jars and such like that. Um, you know, and, and that just wasn't right either, you know, and, um, but just, you know, but just being in there and then after maybe 35, maybe 45 minutes, um, I saw what I needed to see apparently and I left and, but, but it was sad. It was sad. And the smell of death, I will never get out of my nose. Never, you know, and, but just to smell that. And uh, but again, these are our brothers and sisters. Also, my only consolation through all this that these people, they didn't have to suffer anymore. The suffering was over, you know. And, um, suffering was over within the physical realm, at least, you know. And um, and so just to know these people didn't have to go hungry. They. Didn't, a lot of them had bruises on them. A lot of the bruising could have happened after they had died, and how they were uh, how they were put on the gurneys and such like that, right? And but some of these bruises were old, and you can tell an old bruise, yeah. you know. And um, so, how did these people die? I don't know. I mean, it wasn't. You know, we probably had. I think one time I asked my supervisor how many people die a day within this institution. And I think she told me like 10 or 15 a day. Wow. That's a high turnover rate. Yeah, it was. But they always had someone else ready to come in, you know? And so, like I said, there were about 3000 folks there. Some of them were there since they were children. Some of these people that were there, this institution were also Amish. They were also Amish. Really? I yes. I remember, but and, you know, let's go back to the tunnels and then I'll go back to the Amish. But, um, <clears throat> but so then I left, uh, I left that room um, and locked the door behind me. And, and the things that I heard and sensed and I felt and going to the tunnels, I wanted to go to the med center, to the infirmary. Now, I had a friend who worked a night shift at the infirmary. So I knew that he was going to be there, right? And so I had made arrangements that I was gonna come to the tunnel into the infirmary. And uh, so they said that was okay. And uh, so then I went to the infirmary, which was, it took me probably a good 45 minutes to go in the other direction of the infirmary, to get to the infirmary. And the closer that I got there, uh, these sounds, they sounded like I was in, and I don't want to mean, I don't mean to be disrespectful to our brothers and sisters who were in the infirmary, but it sounded like a zoo of what I heard. It, it, it sounded like animals being hurt, um, a lot of screaming, a lot of moaning, a lot of people asking for help. And so went to, I went to the infirmary and my friend was waiting for me there uh, because he knew what time I was going to get there. Hopefully I was going to get there in one piece, right? You never know. And, uh, but anyhow, and so I made it. And so I unlocked the door. It just seemed like one key unlocked every door in the place. It really did. And, um, and so I unlocked the door from the side I was on. And so I went in there and such and, and, um, 
And so I walked through this infirmary. And when you think of infirmary or med center, you're probably, one would think about their own hospital or medical center, right? This was totally different. This was like half the size of a gymnasium. And a lot of these of our brothers and sisters were like in baby beds, but they were metal baby beds and they had a top to them and they were bars. I mean, they were enclosed in this, right? And the smell was horrendous. And, um, but just seeing what I did and what I experienced in the infirmary, I mean, there were people that at one time, I hate to use this term, but back then that's what they used was they were waterheads, they were hydrocephalics, of where their head was just huge, right? And what happens is that they had to have shunts shunts put in to drain the fluid from their brains and everything. And um, but just to see our brothers and sisters like caged animals within, you know, in that, that was very, very sad, you know. And, and um, so I went and I, a lot, of the, a lot of the folks in the infirmary, they would reach out to me. And, and so I touched their hand gently. You know, I touched hand. They needed that human touch. Yeah, a and kind so, touch, not one of these abusive. Right. And so I, and I will never forget that either. And this is really the first time that I've talked about this uh, to people who have not ever probably worked in a state institution, right? But I thought that I, I needed to tell of these experiences so our brothers and sisters who, who do go into these state institutions will be compassionate, right? You know, when I went, and so I was there for about 45 minutes, and uh, and then I left and went through the tunnels again. My friends said, why don't you, instead of going back into the tunnels, why don't you just go out the, you know, out the door and just, you know, and just walk on the grounds and such. And I said, no, I'm going to experience the tunnels. And so I did. And so, again, it was like, do you know how ants make tunnels in sand and dirt, right? Right. Well, this is how there's, there's like a whole labyrinth of different tunnels. I mean, you go this way, then you go to the furthest place out, the building out and such like that. And uh, But there were signs under, uh, you know, in the tunnels, thank God. But anyhow, so I decided that it was time for me to leave. And so, but just walking through those tunnels and trying to digest in what I had just experienced, you know. But again, seeing shadow people and somebody asked me many, many, many years later about if I've ever experienced shadow people. And I said, yes. And I said, I said, one thing about shadow people is that that we are shadows to them as much as what they are shadows to us. They exist in one dimension and we exist in another dimension. You know what I mean? Yeah. And so, you know, and so people must realize a lot of times shadow people are just passing through, are just passing through. And the only reason that we see them is because they are a shadow, right? Mm -hmm. But there are spirits that pass through our homes and among us constantly, constantly there are, you know, a lot of them want to be heard, want to be known, and others don't. Now, I have never been hurt by a shadow person. I, um, I've heard other people talk about shadow people, of how they've been hurt by them, hmm. but I have, I have never experienced that. Have you, Tessa? No, um, and I believe my first encounters with them was around the age of 13 and I'd go running either to the store or whatever um, and I'd hear somebody whispering my name and I'd turn around and I'd see these shadow people ducking in and out of bushes or whatever else and it was mm -hmm. like they were following me but they never did anything harmful to me and like I was telling you earlier you know I believe it was the night that they put Vern on the tube they intubated him uh, due uh -huh. to COVID and um, you know I had my my wailing, crying to God sort of thing here in my office. And then I decided, okay, it's time to go to bed. So I went to bed and I was just sitting there still crying. And all of a sudden this shadow person on my bed peeks around and is looking at my face. And it, it, it was just so stunning to me because 
you know, you think of shadow people as you hear all these dark stories, etc. I do believe that not all shadows that you see in human form are shadow people. I think mm -hmm. some can be uh, spirits that draw from different energies and perhaps they look dark instead of light. Um, I right. don't think it has anything to do with uh, with what they are, good or bad or whatnot. It, it depends on what they're drawing from. But that just really intrigued me because this thing was actually showing genuine concern for me and peeking around at my face. And, you know, um, I didn't even take the time to think about it before I was like, I ain't got time for your shit right now and you better get the fuck away from me. I ain't going to play any shadow people games. You know, just thinking right. shadow people straight on and not even thinking it was later on when I thought back on it that I was like, well, it didn't look like it was trying to do harm to me at all. It was genuinely concerned for me and looking at my face full of tears like, are you okay? But not saying it. Mm -hmm. But that's just how its body language presented itself to me. I don't know. It was pretty intriguing. Um, I was kind of blown mm -hmm. away by it. Right. You know, and and you know and so a person would be intrigued by it you know but again but again in your circumstance as well as a million other circumstances that at that very moment that you did not want to have any have anything around or anyone around you know what i mean it was a quiet moment for you right. um and, and you needed your quiet time but 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 again that shows that not all shadow people are um are um are looking out to hurt us not at all, you know, and um, and so when we get those types of experiences with spirits and everything, to me that <clears throat> excuse me, to me that's a blessing. It's a blessing, you know, uh, that there are a lot of compassionate spirits on the other side. A lot of them, most of them probably are very compassionate. Now there are some that are mischievous. There are a lot of them that you know that want to play games with us and such like that. But how many times do we play games with them? When we go into residential or when we go into these asylums and such, don't don't we play games with them also? Right. Because we're because we're trying to find like who's here by EVPs and all these other machines which drive me nuts, but God bless my brothers and sisters who use them. Um but so we're playing some of the same games they are. And, and people it, have to rhythm realize that too you know yeah and Go it ahead. was interesting to me um also like not only was it happening to me but uh kinsey kept seeing one in her house and it would just stand there in the corner um even mm -hmm. right when she woke up she saw it and pointed at it and said something they couldn't understand what she said but she got up and went to the bathroom and they're like what's going on and she said she didn't want to talk about it and then my 17 year old daughter nova was walking back from her sister's house, which my daughter, oldest daughter, um, lives two houses down from me. So she's walking back, and uh, she was hearing, like, footsteps behind her, and she turned around, and she said she'd see a shadow person dart into the neighbor's yard or whatever, but it was following her, so it, it kind of freaked mm -hmm. her out, but maybe, um, I don't know, maybe they're they're looking out for us or watching us, making sure yeah. we're okay. Um, mm -hmm. This one's following her home. Um, mm -hmm. But it is kind of creepy you know for them because it's, it's the unknown what is it what does it want and automatically mm. you have that fear stricken into you but uh, nothing bad right. came of it i think and it also made me wonder too could that have been Vern in the astral you know mm -hmm. um i don't know there's so many questions mm. right you know it's a you know hopefully hopefully in time we can add all those questions will be answered or we may have to wait until we die ourselves to have those and those questions answered, you know, um, and a lot of times, like you said, I think I think there's a lot of there are, there are millions of very compassionate spirits out there who are genuinely there to help us, um, and like the ones that you saw, kind of like peeking around the corner to see if you were okay and such like that. And um, but I tell people that maybe one should not engage them. You know what I mean? I, when I see a shadow person, I don't I don't talk to, with them. Maybe they can read my mind, possibly. You know what I mean? But you know, but I don't engage with them at all. I I can't think of. Oh gosh, I'm trying to think if I've ever engaged them. I know one time here in my room here in Illinois, where I'm at right now, I remember that. You know, I have many, many candles lit, right? 
And so my room is like my, is my sanctuary, right? And so then, <clears throat> so I will tell the spirits, if anybody wants to come in and because it passed through at any given time, we, they all do. They, like I said, we have spirits around us all the time. Sometimes they'll make themselves known by talking, by, by, by knocking or ticking or those types of things, right? But a lot of times they're just passing on through. But I remember that I was real tired. And I said, okay, then the spirits are here. You can spend the night here, but I want it quiet. No barking, no making noise, no ticking, no knocking, no farting, no belching, nothing. No whispers, nothing. And all at once, Tessa, and my brothers and sisters who are listening to this, I heard audibly with my ear, one of the spirits said, shit. <laughs> and I said, Every I said, everybody out. Everyone, leave leave you know my room is off limits now i'm tired i asked you to behave you know behave in such to act right to be safe here but some of them were going to go for it so unfortunately you can't choose and you can't pick oh well this is a nice spirit so i'll keep him here no no that doesn't happen you need to skin all of them out so i did and then i went to sleep and slept like a baby you know yeah you need your rest man yeah and then but going back into the tunnels and such that you know so i walked back to uh, it probably took me an hour and a half i know that i took a wrong way but for some reason i was supposed to go down this other way and i did and then when i got to the door um it was and i had not seen this so i really got up on it uh that um um that one time it was a door, but they had blocked it. Ooh, they I wonder had, why. They, I, I know. And uh, so I never did find out what was on the other side of that one. How Not did they all. block it? Um, they were, it, it, it was bricked. It was all wow. bricked up. You know? And uh, But again, I just couldn't say, oh, by the way, I was in the tunnel last night, and I went to this place, and there was a brick wall there. Why? You know what I mean? Um I did not want I didn't want them to know that I was there. Um, but again, I probably could have asked permission and probably would have allowed me to do it. Um, but um, anyhow, and so then I had to turn around and go the other way and such like that, you know. But again, I heard I heard voices and and uh, footsteps and those uh, people breathing heavily and such like that, right? Spirits breathing heavily, and. Um, but I never really felt scared when, you know, when I got in there in the first, I kind of did. It was just human nature. Um, but then, but then I felt very comfortable. I felt very, very comfortable, you know, and, and, you know, at one time when I was little, I couldn't stand to be in the dark. Yeah. That bothered me greatly, right? But now, but now I embrace the sacredness of the darkness. I don't mean darkness of the evil one, but it's just dark. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? And, you know, I love my room. I have my candles lit, um, and, uh, but I always blow them out. I usually have just one or two when I am going to go to sleep, right? But prior to that, I have lots of them. And, um, and so then, but I do love the dark. I love the sacredness of the nighttime. I do. I am not scared at all anymore. I, and, um, but um, anyhow, so going back to shadow people, I think that... Um, before you know, we move on like, to shadow people, um, Jemima, and I think you touched on this just a second ago. Um, mm -hmm. but she's like, I'm amazed Robert's not still stuck on uh, in those tunnels. But on a serious note, um, you must have experienced so many emotions while down there. And you did go over uh, the feelings and emotions that you were having. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and I did, and, and now, like, this is the first time that I've talked about it in all these years, 40-some years, uh, you know, and, and you know, and it's just like, I think I needed to relive those sometimes, you know what I mean? Talking about fear, talking about getting over the fear and stuff like that, right? And, um, and but just, I don't know, I felt like a sense of peace and calm, except when I walked to this door, which I thought I could get through, and I couldn't, and it was bricked up. That was that was 
it was like, oh, hell, what am I going to do now? You know what I mean? But anyhow, so I just turned myself around and just walked the other way and, and took a right, I think, I do believe, did down you, another um, time. Did you, being a psychic medium, did you pick up on what was behind the door? Because immediately I'm thinking, instead of burying these bodies, maybe they just, like, put them back in this certain area and just bricked it up. Like, I don't know. Well, it, what it turned out to be that on the other side was an old wood shop. And they had stopped that. It was an old wood shop, and that's what it was. But why break it, it up? Was. Like, you could use that for storage or any number of things, you know? I don't know why. Hmm. Um, know that I tried to find it later, and I asked my friend who works the night shift, you know, and um, he'd been there like 25 years, so he knew, he knew everything about the tunnels, right? And so I asked him about that, and he said, yeah, that's where the workshop was. And uh, too many of the patients, they called them patients back then, right? Mm -hmm. Too many of the were getting hurt. Was it uh, by accident or did something malicious happen to them? Right. You know, you never know. First place, what is a patient doing who's in a state hospital? What is the patient doing in a wood shop? And why is it down in the tunnel? We... That is the weirdest freaking thing to me. I don't know. You know I'm not buying it. You know? <laughs> It was just, I'm suspicious. It was just, it was just weird. Um, but all these places, these tunnels go to, when you go into them, like into the infirmary, there is a way out through a main door to walk outside. And at one time within this wood shop, that a lot of times because of inclement weather and whatever, that these tunnels were used, right? And so this was just one of the ways to get to the wood shop, okay? A lot yeah. of the people who worked, I mean, yeah, who worked in this state hospital, who maybe was like uh, the superintendent, also the different psychiatrists. Now, these psychiatrists were not Americans. They were from Eastern Europe. I remember Dr. Pluma. She was, she was from Romania. And when she spoke, she sounded like Bela Lugosi. I mean, she was she was creepy in itself. Oh, wow. Really, was, <laughs> you, know? <laughs> you know, and so a lot of it, like, if the wood shop would have not been blocked, I could have gone through there and gone through, you know, gone through this huge area, and I could have gone right through the front door if it was still there, but the wood shop no longer exists. None whatsoever. And in fact, that wood shop at one time made the caskets, the coffins oh, wow. uh, for, the, for the people and such like that. So I experienced a lot of things within, you know, like heard voices. I heard footsteps behind me. Um, I did hear some spirits like talk in my, talk in my ear and ask me what I was doing. What are you do I remember like, what are you doing? What do you want? And so, so that was almost like I was invading their space. Right. They're safe you know? down there away from everybody. Right. But again, a lot of these, of our brothers and sisters, they were tortured terribly down in these, down in these uh, tunnels also. There were rings that I found, like, um, they, they were like these huge metal rings that were put in, um, the walls. And so I asked about that later on to my friend. And he had said at one time that a lot of the patients were taken down there and they were chained down into these tunnels. Oh my goodness. And nobody could hear them scream. I mean, even if I needed help down there, nobody, would, no one would hear me because again, there was a basement and a sub basement. Do you know what I mean? And these tunnels are way below earth and everything. Right. And these tunnels were built. They were built because I'm five eleven. So the and I probably had, uh, probably uh, another two or three feet above that. Right. And so these tunnels were made for people to stand up in, and they were wide enough for a gurney. Probably they were wide enough for probably three or four people to walk through at one time together. So they were pretty big and everything. And um, um, but just being in there, I was only in there that one night. And I guess I experienced what I needed to experience. And that was it. Um, but I will never forget that experience. I will never forget the smell and such like that. Um, 
But when I first started to talk about my experiences, I didn't think anybody would be even interested about these tunnels or talking about being in these institutions where I, you know, where I worked for a brief period of time, right? I didn't think anybody would be a, would even want to know that, right? But then I realized that, uh, and then, and that, um, and that was early on. Um, and so then people began to um, go into these places and investigate, right? And then after hearing people and then watching these damn shows on TV, oh my God. And um, so, so that opened my eyes that maybe I need to talk about my experiences within, you know, within being in these state hospitals working, right? And everything. And so, um, and so just being there. And so that's why I'm talking about it now because there's very few of us who are still alive um, that have worked in these state hospitals. We may have had, some people have maybe had mothers, fathers, maybe grandmothers, you know what I mean? But for someone, you know, like their age and whatever, right? And for me personally, um, I guess I just took it for granted that everyone within the paranormal field, not everyone, but but maybe a minority of people <clears throat> probably have worked in these state hospitals, you know? Um, but you don't hear of people telling of their own experiences within them. Well, it's pretty traumatic, you know, and, um, you know, a lot of these shows are shit and some of them Mm. are more factual and true. Um, but, um, sometimes they interview these people and there's so much pent up emotion, even so many years ago. It's kind of like if you went to Vietnam, most people that go to Vietnam don't sit there and brag about it as the ones that are, uh, faking the funk and saying, oh, I was in Vietnam and lying about it, that are sitting there sharing right. all these stories that they probably heard from somebody else or, or made it up or whatever. Generally, when right. you go through a traumatic experience like that, you don't share mm-hmm. it unless you're in, in company where you can trust a person. Right. And I have very good friends this day that I met in Iowa, and we're still friends to this day. We're very, very good friends. You know, and um, and they have experiences themselves, you know, and um, but just but but just working there and experiencing what I did um, and just seeing what I excuse me, just excuse me, no, but but just experiencing what what I sensed and what I felt. the smells, hearing the screams, even in employee, um, employee housing, you could hear screams at night. And they were coming from, I mean, there were actually screams. And they were coming from different buildings. Mm-hmm. You know, when you have people, you know, on, I think it was like 2,300 acres of land. And here it is way out in the country, as we say, cornfields and soybeans fields around us, right? Right. You know, and so you are going to hear those types of things that go on and such, you know, and I understand that, you know, a lot of people hear those when they go into these vacant buildings, you know, because all that energy is imprinted and all the crap that has happened and such like that, you know, and seeing people being put in four point restraint, five point restraint, um, you know, and being put in seclusion, you know, and just different things. I remember it's that. Terrible. There, yes, because as being social animals, it is hell for us to be isolated. That's why during COVID, how many people had to isolate themselves? Right, and I Millions. feel bad because, like, you know, I was afraid. I'm still scared shitless of COVID, but less afraid mm-hmm. now that I've gotten it. You know, now I know I have mm-hmm. immunities. That should last me at right. least three to four months, hopefully forever, because it was the Omicron virus. But um, I don't know. Uh, I had the kids out of school. We did homeschool hell this last year. And I felt so bad mm-hmm. because it was my daughter's first year of school. And it's supposed to oh. be about learning and making friends, et cetera, et cetera. But um, this year, I allowed them to go back because they all begged. They're like, please, just let us go to school. And and so mm-hmm. I did, and and it freaks me out because every day I'm getting these emails about different classes where there's 
um, positive cases, etc., etc., and I'm just like, man, is it going to hit again? You know, you kind of get traumatized by that as well, but I mean, it's, it's right. scary and it's sad, and like you said, it takes us out of that human range where people go to gatherings, and people still do, but generally something as far as an outbreak or something else could happen, but I don't know, the right. whole human condition right. and needing to talk to someone, see someone, feel someone, mm -hmm. so right. hard. Right, it is. You know, there, you know, it's one thing having computers and we can FaceTime and Zoom and Melon and whatever else they use out there, right? But it's just a fact being human beings that we need that human touch. Unfortunately now, because of this home and e-learning and all this stuff and people are texting instead of calling each other and such and that, <clears throat> that the generation of children, you know, have a lot of them don't know how to socialize right. now. You know what I mean? And that is very scary in itself. It is. Yeah, and I'm lucky uh, to have a few children, you know, so at least they have that instead of if I had mm -hmm. just a single child, that would be hard. Right. Oh, very much so. Very much so. And uh, But hopefully this spring people can get out and about. Uh, they can do what they want to do and those types of things. You know, this COVID thing could be with us until the end of time. It could be. You know what I mean? Um, it's just like, you know, it's just like with the bubonic plague. There is, I, I know that many years ago um, when I was in Arizona, and a lot of people do catch the bubonic plague still, right? But you never hear about it. Yeah, I heard a doctor I when I was in ICU talking about it, talking about that and hantavirus, but there's, it's still out there. Right, it is, especially like in Arizona. Uh, you know, in Arizona one time, a lot of our Native American brothers and sisters, they were sheep herders, right? And she'd have something to do with the bubonic plague, right? Anyhow, there is a percentage of people in Arizona or in the southwestern states that still get the bubonic plague. And it may, maybe it's 5% at the highest. You know what I mean? But it's not every day. You know what I mean? It's not, you know, and and... It's just, it's just insidious. It really, really is. It actually, and, um, uh, you're right. I do. I don't think it comes from the sheep. I think it comes from being in the fields. The prairie dogs actually carry it. Oh, I see. Yeah. Okay. Okay. But I know that maybe. Well, you know what? I don't. I don't know why the native, especially in the desert areas of Arizona, why in the bubonic plague could be. It could have mutated in the sand also. You know yeah, what I, I mean? think it's because the, um, I almost said hamsters, <laughs> the prairie dogs, the extra large hamsters, now they're running around out there and they pee and they poop and that's how it spreads, just like the hantavirus. It's through their droppings or if you eat it or whatever and it's so dry and dusty out there that when the sheep are going and you're herding and following the sheep, it kicks all right. that crap up into the air. Mm, okay, um, okay, so that makes sense. It's just like, you know, Tess and my brothers and sisters, it's just like, tuberculosis 100 years ago. Where do they send the people? They sent them to Arizona. They sent them to the southwestern states because the weather was nicer. It was dry, right? Well, the tuberculosis, um, it wasn't dumb because it mutated. And it mutated in the sand, right? And I know that of people um, in New Mexico, Arizona, uh, Texas, probably South Texas, that when there is a dust storm, okay, and there's, and I've been through several dust storms and when I lived in Phoenix, is that, um, is that it had mutated, the tuberculosis had mutated into something called valley fever. Yes, my sister got that. Okay. And the valley fever, if it wasn't for all the people who had tuberculosis going, to those specific states or in the desert area, we would not have valley fever today. Valley fever is just a strain of <clears throat> a strain of tuberculosis. Oh, wow. Okay, so when I was in Arizona, and so I went from Iowa to Arizona and was there for six months, and I worked in the state hospital there. And you and I thought that it was horrible in in Iowa, but this was in downtown Phoenix, very close to Sky Harbor Airport, where yeah, the, that's where, where my the, mom and sister live. Okay, where, where the Arizona State Hospital is, right in Phoenix, 
One, I think one's road is uh, Roosevelt Street, huge area. And uh, but anyhow, I remember that. Um, and any time that you're going to be in the very in the area with a lot of uh, people that are jammed together, you know what I mean? A lot of concentrated people, right? Um, that one could be exposed to tuberculosis. Mm-hmm. Well, I was. I was because it, because it lives in the spores. You know, people, you can be, as they say sometimes, you can be half a mile away and somebody with tuberculosis and they coughed and if it's coming your way, you possibly could get it, right? Anyhow, I have been exposed to tuberculosis back then and, um, and, I, and I just wasn't feeling well, so they gave me a TB time test, as they say, right? Mm-hmm. And, um, so I took, and my arm would just got huge. Oh man, huge! And so that was an indication that I had been exposed to it. Right? right. So at that time, the regimen was these huge white horse pills. So I had to take Yay. those for <laughs> few months and everything. No booze, couldn't drink at all, and stuff like that. That's where those polyps oh, came from. <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and then, um, um, and then. Uh, oh, and then your piece t- turned all sorts of colors, and it was just bizarre. Anyhow, so every year I have to go in for a chest X-ray, and you know it's negative by the grace of God. But I also test positive uh, for Valley Fever, wow. and okay, and so that was many, many moons ago. But <clears throat> what happens to me personally is that if I get a cold and it goes down in my chest, that because of Valley Fever. Um, and being exposed to tuberculosis, that it really just kind of like really affects my uh, my breathing, my lungs, and such like that. Right. Um, you know, but again, I go in for a yearly chest X-ray. My lungs are clear and such like that. Right. And so I've been exposed to that. Also, when I was in Arizona, I was working there. The I was working um, on an all female ward. So I went from the men in went to one of the men in Iowa now to a female ward, right? And there were eighty five females. They were all most of them were schizophrenic, if not paranoid schizophrenics, right? Right. And and um, let me tell you, I'd rather work with a million nothing against women, God bless them. <laughs> I'd rather work with a million psychiatrically ill men than work with 85 psychiatrically ill women. They're very scary. They are. I mean, it's just, I mean, what I saw them do with a lot of things. I mean, I've seen people eat their own feces. I've seen that. Okay. And to clean that up is a mess in itself too. But Mm -hmm. it's something that I, right. But when you see a woman during her monthly cycle, you know, get a tampon and do all sorts of things with it. You know what I mean? Oh no, um, yeah, that's bad. So just think of the so just think of the worst scenario. Um, and during their time of the month, of course, you know they were psychiatrically ill. But when their emotions ran high, hormone hormones and such like that. Oh my God, they were just horrible to each other. Oh my God, it was just like no wonder I'm gay. You're like someone no, get you know, me out of here right now. <laughs> yeah, but I love. But I loved I loved working with both. Right. I learned a lot in Arizona, <clears throat> and but their methods, their methods. I hate to cut you off. I don't with, want to cut you off. I really sorry. hate to, but we do have to go to our second music break. Okay, that's fine. Awesome. Okay. Well, on this music break, we have Mr. Brick Casey once more from Boston, and then we have Miss Nonya Toria from Ghana, South Africa, with Monyaye. Paper Lovin', which is a remix with uh, Mr. Chris. And then she's also going to be singing Yanga. You guys don't go anywhere. We'll be right back after this musical break. I like it when you pop it, drop it, swing. Now I don't stop it, doing that thing. Go, go, girl, keep doing that thing. I just want to make you my main thing. Keep going, baby, now don't you stop that. Oh. Vanilla chocolate flavor, girl. The only one that I'm searching for. You're the one for me and I can't complain. Sunshine anytime it rain Not around then I might go insane I just wanna make you my main thing I like it when you pop that, drop that Keep going baby, now don't you stop that uh, Honey, you so sweet, I can't ignore 
think about you, boot more and more. Making it pop and drop and swing. I can be the king and you my queen. Yeah, you're yeah, good, but you I'm saying. I just wanna make you my main thing. I like it when you pop that, drop that, keep going, baby. Now don't you stop that. In the back with the black on Too deep, don't sleep or slack on Come to the money, honey, I'ma get a stack on Excuse me, mom, can I get my Mac on? To the left, then, throw it to the right Ooh. Do it like Ooh. you wanna do it to me all night Ooh. From Ooh. the block, kid, know how to act hard Like brick house, women with a fat backyard yeah. In the club with me and my man's killing that In the back door with me and my man chilling that chillin I'm on the floor, I'm like, damn, she killing that It's going down, no cop around, feeling that feelin I'm that. fly, I'm a guy that I get him get Player get like me, me, two of you with him Call with you a lollipop and I wanna let you Number one I'm my top choice of pet. Come on, give it to me, mom. Go, go, girl. Now don't stop. Oh, no, girl. Break it down for me. Get it, get it gone. Can you keep it going? Oh, no, no, you know. Now give it to me, mom. Go, go, girl. Now don't stop. Oh, no, girl. Hey, break it down for me. Get it, get it gone. Cause you got it going. Oh, no, no, Can't deny the way that you too fly. And the time that I look you in the eye. A phenomenon that I can't explain. Like the things you're doing to my brain. You don't really want to take away my pain. I just want to make you my brain. Don't you stop that uh, Can't stop thinking about how you move And all the things that I'ma do to you True, this might be a little bit strange Don't care if I don't even know your name So I wanna tell you this simple and plain I just wanna make you my main thing I like it when you pop that, drop that Keep going, baby, now don't you stop that uh, them chicks all thick with the pumps on Lumps in the front, back with the bumps on Not a cat hoping that he get his humps on I'm way beyond with the mother chumps on Sweet enough to eat and he might bite you bite Wanna make you. love to you, I don't wanna fight you Nobody body you. like you, not a one like you When like you come you. around, no telling what he might do True. Right True. now in the club, who the dawn? Don't a man that got it going on later on I could tell by the dancing, you digging this song You can tell I've been digging you all night long And I love to be digging in you all night long Party right here, hotty all night long Let's flex it to the coat check, exit to the Lexus, Nexus, Triple Lexus. Come on, yeah, give it to me, mom. Go, go, girl. Now nah, don't stop. Oh, no, girl. Break it down for me. Hit it, get it gone. Can you keep it going? Oh, no, no, no. Now nah, give it to me, mom. Go, go, girl. Now nah, don't stop. Oh, no, girl. Hey, break it down for me. Hit it, get it gone. Cause you got it going. Oh, no, no, no. I like it when you pop it, drop it, swing. Now nah, don't stop it, doing that thing. Go, go, girl. Keep doing that thing. I just wanna make you my main. I like it when you pop it, drop it, swing. Now nah, don't stop it, doing that thing. Go, go, girl, keep doing that thing I just wanna make you my main thing Vanilla chocolate flavor, girl The only one that I'm searching for You the one for me and I can't complain You sunshine anytime it rain Not around then I might go insane I just wanna make you my main thing I like it when you pop that, drop that Keep going, baby, now don't you stop that uh, Honey, you so sweet, I can't ignore Thinking about you, put more and more Making it pop and drop and swing I could be the king and you my queen Yeah, look good, but you I just wanna make you my main thing. I like it when you pop that, drop that, keep going, baby. Now don't you stop that. Oh, oh. Can't get not fool that you too fly. And the time that I look you in the eye, a phenomenon that I can't explain. Like the things you're doing to my brain, you don't really wanna take away my pain. I just wanna make you my main thing. I like it when you pop that, drop that, keep going, baby. Now don't you stop that. Oh. Can't stop thinking about how you move and all the things that I'ma do to you. True, this might be a little bit strange. If I don't even know your name That's so why I wanna tell you this simple and plain I just wanna make you my main thing I like it when you pop that, drop that Keep going baby, now don't you stop that oh.
Understand that you were made for a money man, but if you can't love me now, don't love me later. When my later is much greater, it only proves that you love the paper, my paper. Boy, me gon' love you now, me gon' love you later. When your later is much greater, cause me a one man trafficator, trafficator. Yeah. You say I love him, but I love you more. He took me shopping sprees and bought me liner. That you love the paper, my paper. my paper Boy, me gon' love you now, me gon' love you later When your later is much greater Cause me a one-man trafficator, trafficator but on the means to you for sell it all for vanity, no. Bright lights, fast cars, and this is the eye. And the fast lane make you lose your sanity. But me can't believe it, sell yourself so short. Forget the money you will make, man, break your parts. But you up. your life make your choice because me now make you break my heart, no. If you can't love me now, don't love me later. Love me when later. my later is much greater, it only proves that you love the paper. Proves that you love the paper, paper, paper. Boy, me gon' love you now, me gon' love you later. When your later is much greater, cause me a one man trafficator, trafficator. Yeah. I wanted to learn the hard way, so I'm taking you to love at school. You want money just for parties, yeah. You take me for fool. Every piece of my heart I gave away. Give it away to you Why don't you understand, babe What I feel for you is true So If you can't love me now Don't love me later When my later is much greater It only proves that you love the paper My paper For me gon' love you now Me gon' love you later When your later is much greater
Welcome back, and thank you so much for joining us this evening on We Are Paradox Media's Late Night in the Rockies. I'm your host, Tessa TNT, and I'm so grateful you guys are here this evening, and I'm so grateful for our guest, Mr. Robert Ricci. Robert, welcome back, and thank you so much for hanging out with us tonight and sharing your experience and your knowledge with us. I, I am eternally grateful. Well, thank you so very much, Tessa. I appreciate you so much. And Colorado is just one of those beautiful, beautiful areas in this country. There are so many beautiful areas um, in this country. Uh, Colorado has always called me. Mm -hmm. And just briefly about Colorado is that many, many moons ago, this is how old, 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 old I am, is that John Denver, of course, he was from Colorado, right? Uh -huh. Anyhow, he was going to be at Red Rocks. And oh, wow. That's so epic. He, that's like nature's, yeah. uh, what do they call it, Nat auditorium or whatnot. It's so beautiful. And the acoustics. Natural, yeah, natural amphitheater. Yes. And so my friends and I, we were at that time, It was we lived in the panhandle of Texas in Amarillo. And so we went to Colorado. And um, anyhow, and to hear John Denver in this natural amphitheater. Oh, my it goodness. Was just, I'm getting goosebumps was, right now. <laughs> so, so I can talk about that later also. But anyhow, my experiences in so many different places. And when I'm on next time, my brothers and sisters, that I will talk about my experience with our Navajo brothers and sisters and our Zuni brothers and sisters also, and what I experienced and also going to Cortez, Colorado, and uh, why that why we went there and uh, my experience there it was fascinating and also going like i said to canyon de Chez and also going uh to um oh i just said that oh to the royal gorge mm -hmm. and they have a park there like that and so just going there was just beautiful also but my experiences i i have experienced so much in my life and the more I talk about the things that I've never talked about before, all these memories are just rushing back to me and such like that. And, and again, I'm no greater or less than anyone else, you know, but these are my experiences. And we all have experiences. We all do. And, yeah, uh, and I so think, I like uh, Jemima was saying earlier, no matter how good or bad they are, they make us who we are. Mm -hmm. It's a learning experience. Us as spirit people having this human experience. That's how we learn, and that's how we grow and become the beautiful people we are. 
Amen. That is very, very true. And the experiences that our that our brothers and sisters who are spirits now, I would love to learn more about their experiences in their lives. You know what I mean? That would just be fascinating. It would be fascinating to learn how and why about how um these people got to state hospitals. I understand during that time that a child could be just left at the gates. Anybody mm-hmm. could be left at the well, it was so sad. Hospital. Like I was saying, that show I was watching the other day, um, there was a rec- recording because a reporter had gone in there. I think it was the late 70s, early 80s. I'm thinking late 70s, though. And uh-huh. he's talking to this little boy, and, and this little boy is not happy whatsoever. He He's saying, like, he hasn't had any good experiences at all, and they're, uh, he's very unhappy. And uh, they asked him, do you remember coming here? And he said, no, he doesn't remember going there. And it, it just makes you wonder why. Right. Yeah, you know, and so just to just to know those experiences and such like that. But the next experience that I'm going to be talking about is the Valeska Murder House, Axe Murder House in Valeska, Iowa. And I think I had sent you pictures before, haven't I? Yes, you sent me um, a picture of the front of the place. So it showed the sign and the building. Um, but that right. was about it. And you were just saying, hey, I'm going here. I was like, woo. Mm-hmm. Um, I've seen different recordings of that, but I, I can't wait to hear your experience. Okay. And also that I took a lot of pictures inside the house. And I know, I know at one time, okay, the caretaker of the house is a young man. He's probably in his 30s. And he takes care of it for these people who don't live in Valeska, Iowa, which is um, in the southwestern part of Iowa. They live clear on the eastern side of Iowa. And um, anyhow, so I asked about taking pictures. She says, fine, don't worry about it. Go ahead and do it. You can videotape and such like that. Um, And also, I said, well, I know that I was told through the grapevine that we could not sleep in the beds. And they said, go for it. He said, if you want to sleep on those beds, go for it. Oh, wow. The only bed that we could not sleep in was the parents' bed. And that's because when Ghost Adventures were there, they broke the bed. Jeez. They broke it. Come on, guys. I know. I know. You know, they flopped on the bed. I I shouldn't say that. I don't know how it was broken, but they, they broke it. Yeah. And. And uh, but anyhow, and you think with all the money Ghost Adventures had that they would pay for that bed being fixed, but they never did. Oh my gosh, they never did. So, anyhow, so during the height of COVID, of course, it was closed. I have gotten number on a telephone number um, on um, on Facebook, and so I called the owner, and they said, right now, there at that time, they were not taking any any reservations at all. But she said, call back within a couple months. And she took my number two and she and she called me back months later. And she goes and she goes, we're just booking now. And what date do you want? Because it's booking fast. Everybody wants to go there. OK. And so it, so it was in September of not last year, but the year before that. OK, <clears throat> it was in September. And unfortunately, I was going to go live, right? But they had no Verizon cell phone service there oh my at goodness. all. None. I'm Verizon too, no. and yeah, we don't get a, a, as much coverage as some other right. providers, and especially in that part of Iowa. Anyhow, <clears throat> anyhow, so I thought, well, you know, it's fine. I can't go live, and I was going to, and but you know what? Everything happens for a reason. Anyhow, it so does. we get there. It was like for four of us, it was four hundred and fifty dollars to spend twenty four hours there. Oh wow! And so we did. You know, they gave us the key. The gentleman met us next door. Um, you know, at the house and such like that. Behind it, there's like a barn, but the barn is really uh, their office and such like that. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> Excuse me. No worries. And um, and so we and so we had to pay a deposit beforehand. We paid the rest of the balance when we got there. Gave us a key and just told us to lock up, put the key in a certain place when we left, and that was it. And um, anyhow, so then, so we got there early. It was about three o'clock in the afternoon, and of course, in the fall, 
September, things are going to get darker faster, right? But anyhow, and so we got there, and uh, and so the gentleman met us there, and says, like I said, gave us the key, uh, the the do's and don'ts. But there was really a lot of don't. I mean, a lot of. I mean, we could really do what we wanted to do. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. And very gentleman, he was going to be away for the weekend, but he gave me his cell phone number. Um, if we had any trouble, he was up, he was going to be like 50 miles away visiting relatives or something. And uh, he and his family. He said, if you need anything, just call us, call me, you know, and such like that. Anyhow, and so that's when I sent you the picture of me standing in front of it or behind the Velasca, you know. But, you know, uh, <clears throat> driving there, it's off the Interstate 80 in the southwestern part of Iowa. And at that time, I was with my friends in Nebraska. So we drove probably four hours, five hours to get there. And so we got there and it was still, you know, and um, and how so we wanted to go through the little town. But it's weird because we have gone there before just to drive by it. And there are no signs at all to find this place. Not at all. Did you find it on Google Maps or? Well, I don't even know. I don't even know how to do that. And so anyhow, so we stopped at the Casey's and anyhow, we're looking for the Luska murder house. And so they explained to us where it was and such like that. And this little town, it it's creepy anyhow, right? And there there are children there because there's grade schools there. There's a Catholic church there. Of course, there's other Protestant churches there also, right? There's also public schools, like I said. And there's even a high school there. And uh, but anyhow, but it was so weird because no children was out. No children were outside playing. None whatsoever. That was just weird to me. It was a beautiful fall day, like I said. And it was like it was like probably the last of September. Right. But anyhow, it was a very nice day and such when we got there. And but that's what I noticed. There just wasn't any children out playing. Hell, we didn't even see any dogs. We heard them, but we didn't see them running around, which is weird in itself, too, you know. And a uh, very beautiful little town. And so we decided to eat at that cafe. And uh, so we told them why we were there and such like that. And, and a beautiful little cafe. It was old, old, old cafe. And uh, so the waitress or the owner, whose daughter was a waitress there, uh, was telling us more about it and about the thousands of people that come there a year and such like that. But on the other hand, the town apparently does not want, uh, there's no signs when you get into Velasca, there's no signs like, oh, turn right here to the extra, uh, you know, to the house, right? They just want it to go away. Right, they do. But on the other hand, I mean, this little town makes a lot of money, like to do the cafe and cases and such like that, right? And uh, you think they would embrace it, but uh, they don't. Um, but anyhow, so we drive up. It is on a corner. Across the street is like assisted living type of like old folks, old folks um, assisted living possibly. Anyhow, and so we went, like I said, we went to eat first and then we came back. We got the key and all that. And we went to the house and it smelled old. And, but just the feeling that I was getting that we're going to be in the house where these innocent children and their children's friends, two little girls, were there also, right? I know. I felt so bad for them. You know, they went to church service with this family, and it got dark really Mm -hmm. fast. Like you said, the sun goes down earlier. So they were Mm -hmm. looking out for their safety. They didn't want them to walk home at that time. And, of course, there's Mm -hmm. no phones at that time either. So, you know, they just kept them. Oh, my goodness. Right. They went to a, um, a church revival a tent revival back then, okay? And um, so they came home late and such like that. Now, the the man, the father, uh, was very wealthy. And they're thinking, there's a lot of conspiracies out there. Uh, they believe that possibly maybe, maybe the father, you know, screwed somebody over in a deal or whatever it was. Or they thought maybe that it was actually... Uh, There is one uh, story that I read that people believe that it was the minister that had come there that was in this tent revival Mm -hmm. that made him. Uh, There were other stories because the train was very close to them. Yeah, there's a train hopper dude. 
Right. And there was a train and we heard it all night. It was so close you could hear it. I mean, it was really, really close, right? And uh, but anyhow, so we walked in. And of course, we already know about the story and people have seen movies about it and stuff like that. But, but, uh, but I still had an open mind, of course, you know. Right. I wanted to go in there and just see. I touched everything. They had dolls. They had, I mean, everything, okay? And uh, so just walking through there and going up the stairway upstairs, I mean, you could smell how old this building is, right? And like uh, moth the wood holes. floor. Yeah, and the wood floors, and they creaked, and the stairs mm-hmm. creaked. And uh, so, but anyhow, but just the different things that I felt when I would touch something and I touched everything there. Right. And, um, and, but I, but there were some, like two of my friends that went with me, they were very skeptical about, about the paranormal. Right. And um, anyhow, they didn't experience anything, nothing. Well, that's what you get for being a non-believer. Right. Nothing at all, you know. But my other friend, Jan, and myself, so we went all through the house and touched everything, and we looked at everything and such and talked about it. Well, I, Jan and I, it was getting late, okay? So Jan and I, well, do you know what? First, I went downstairs in the basement by myself. See, and, and I've never like even a, seen the basement. Everybody focuses on the house and the upstairs and everything. Right. I've never even heard of the basement. There is a cellar. You can't, you, at one time you could get to it from the house itself, but they blocked it off, right? Yeah. But they have their cellar and you go around and it's on the side, it's on the eastern side of the house and you just lift up this door, you go down these, these steps, I think maybe 10 of them, and you're down in the basement. The basement was used as a cellar and such, and, uh, <clears throat> and it was all still dirt and you know, everything. Um, but you know, I just sat there by myself because some people believe that's how the gentleman got in was through the cellar up, you know, up into the house that way. I heard he that. Did. And then I also heard the attic. Right. And there was also and, but, like cigarette butts found too. And nobody in the house smoked. Right. And there, the attic is weird because, because the, the bedrooms, most of the bedrooms are upstairs, as I remember, okay? Right. And you walk up there, but there is like a little, like a playroom, and it goes into their attic mm-hmm. and such, right? And that's weird because we have to really bend down to get through this little doorway. Mm-hmm. So you can know that children had played there and such. Anyhow, so <clears throat> Jan and I decided there were, we went into one bedroom and Um, And so that's where the kids slept. So I slept in one bed. Jan slept in the other. And what we felt. So you guys slept in the kids' room? Uh Uh-huh, yes. Oh, wow. Yes. Now, okay, so there were two big beds, plus they had a little crib Mm -hmm. for the baby, right? For the little kid. And so anyhow, so we slept in there. And what we felt, what we felt, what I felt, and what Jan felt was incredible. Just laying there in a, on a bed, you know, that these children were murdered in, okay? Um, just to feel that energy and the sadness. And they had little dolls and everything around and such like that. But just to feel that. And I did go to sleep. You know, my, you know, I felt it, you know, it was weird sleeping in a bed that somebody was murdered in. Right. But, um, anyhow, and so we went to sleep and all at once because the other two people did not, they never came up. So these are the very same beds that they were murdered in. They didn't like replace the mattresses or they did. They see, that's one thing. Like some people said they did, but the gentleman that we spoke to had said, that some of the furnishings were brought in, but mm-hmm. the main stuff was still there because when this person bought it many, many years ago and so it's like that, it was really in disarray. Yeah. It was a mess, a hot mess. And, um, and, but a lot of the furnishings were the furnishings that were there. And so the beds that were there were the same beds where these children were murdered in, okay? And, and and so when it came to the mattress, when you when you slept on the mattress, it did feel old. It mm-hmm. smelled old. Okay? And springs poking and you yeah. and stuff. 
Well, no, there were no springs, and that was so okay. weird about it. So that no that does show that it's really old. Right, and if and if the beds were not soft, there's almost like they were like maybe horse hair or maybe there was straw in the beds itself. Um, but just laying in that room where these children, even if it wasn't the same mattress, you know what I mean? Yeah. That somebody would come up and had murdered them, had killed them with an axe, right? And uh, but you know, but just being in that room and sensing and feeling all this stuff, it was like it, sometimes it was overpowering. It was very, very overpowering to be in a place and you feel the imprint, or I did at least, you know what I mean, of everything that went on there. Now the kids love to play, okay? So the playroom was just very. It was in the attic, as they say. But it was very close to the room that I was in. It was like that, like I said, you go from the bedroom that I was in or you can go downstairs, right? Everything was kind of open. But you go through this room, uh, down this hallway, and then you go through this other room, and then you go to where where you have to bend down where the kids would have played and right. such like that. And there's dolls there and there's different toys and people have left toys and stuff like that. And, uh, and, uh, but anyhow, but just being there, knowing what happened, you know, it just overwhelmed me. I felt very sad and such like that. Um, did I hear screams? No. A lot of people say they do and maybe they do, but I didn't. I just felt this overwhelming sadness that I was sleeping in a bed it was in the same position it was when the guy came up if it was a guy uh, you know and um um that murdered these children and so I sensed a lot of things felt a lot of things um heard a lot of things I heard children laughing That's very awesome. faintly Dan heard them too um but just being in that house and just experiencing the carnage. And so at night when I, I did, I did go to sleep about two o'clock in the morning and so it's like that. And, um, and so, but just to, I fell asleep and just to have a dream about, it was like a slideshow. So you did, I was, I was about to ask, did you have dreams about what happened? Yes, I did. And so I had, a, I had a dream, but I couldn't see the guy's face. I just knew he was wearing black, but a lot of preachers back then wore black too. But you know what I mean? Right. But, but it was like a slideshow of how these innocent children died so horribly. That's what I experienced. Yeah, and there's this theory, uh, somebody was like, uh, perhaps it was the preacher and the guy that jumped off the train that was known for killing mm -hmm. other people too. But at the same time, the evidence as far as him carrying around that axe and the drips that came off the axe, if there was more than one uh, weapon, you'd see more evidence and it, it'd be different. You know, the drips off an axe would be different than drips off a something else, you know? Right. Well, you know, what they did, now this wasn't the axe that actually did it, but they did have an axe in the house, I think, just for theatrics, maybe. I wonder or whatever, what they did right? with the original one because he did leave it behind. Right. Because I asked the gentleman, I said, is the axe there? And he said, it's not the original one. Okay. Mm -hmm. It's not the original one. But anyhow, but just being in that, I did, like I said, I did sense a lot. I did feel a lot. Um, I heard the children playing and stuff like that. <clears throat> we did bring certain things. We did bring dolls and such like that, that we left, like everyone else have left dolls also, right? Um, but just being in that room, being in that house, um, the how, you know, houses back then were not, I mean, it was comfortable for its time. You know what I mean? Right. Um, you know, <clears throat> but but it was just a plain house. If, if, if it wasn't for the sign out there, Velasca Murder House, or, you know, Axe House, as I sent you, no one would know what happened in there. No one would. You know what I mean? Um, it just looked like an old farmhouse, basically. Right. You know? Looks like an um, old school but, house with a sign in front. I don't remember seeing yeah. you in the pictures, so I don't know if 
if you sent these to somebody to else. Go. But yeah, check out the messenger mm -hmm. and see. Um, and send me the ones that you didn't, because I'd definitely love to see those. But continue. I'm okay. sorry. Okay. And so I will do that. And um, But just being there, sensing and feeling what I did, having this most incredible dream um, of like a slideshow of what happened. And I did see someone with an axe. I saw them being, I saw them being just horribly murdered like that and just like that. And I remember waking up and I had tears in my eyes of what I experienced Aww. and everything. Um, but a lot of people go there, my friend, uh, and they never experience anything, nothing. Yeah, it's totally quiet. They just get fillings or maybe creaks on the mm -hmm. stairs or the smallest right. thing, but sometimes it's super mm -hmm. active. Right, it is, you know, and, you know, and that could be for a lot of reasons. It could be active maybe during, maybe at the time of the anniversary. You know, That's what, what I'm thinking happened. too. Like that would be okay. prime time to go back just because of residuals or whatnot. Mm -hmm. But but it was just but it was just overwhelmingly sad. It, I, you know, so I walked in thinking, you know, if I experience something, great, fantastic. And if I don't, that's okay too. It is, you know. Uh, but I did, like I said, I did hear children playing. Um, I did hear the little girls, you know, laughing and such like that. Uh, but then when I went to sleep is when the slideshow began of seeing, seeing the carnage and seeing all the blood and the gore. You know what I mean? So do you like think said, that I, was from the eyes of the killer that you saw the dream or just just from yeah. the house? Well, I, maybe a combination of both. I know that when somebody asks me to help them, I will ask my angels, that I want to experience what they did, right? I want to experience that so I know how to help our brothers and sisters who are in need, right? Right. And so before I went to sleep, I asked my angels, and I said it out loud, loud and Jan heard me, and I was talking to my angels, and I said, you know, Angelina and Raphael, please, I want to experience what these poor children did and this family did. I want to experience that. And like I said, I finally did go to sleep um, these beds are not comfortable. <laughs> They're not By comfortable. By no means. <laughs> no, 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 no. And, uh, but anyhow, and uh, so I went to sleep. And like I said, it was like a slideshow. And it seemed like the slideshow went on forever and ever, this dream that was so very lucid and so very vivid. And So is um, it true here, that they like started, I think they started in the parents' room. And then went downstairs, then went back up to the other kids' room, or they started in the parents' room, went to the kids' room upstairs, and then downstairs. You know, there were so many different stories. So yeah, many but what did you stories. see in your slideshow? Like, what did your slideshow okay. show? Well, my slide, the most horrifying about this was that one of the little kids got up. Who yes, wasn't murdered didn't she hide life. in the closet and they found her? Yeah. Yes, and he found her. Oh, yes. my God. And, you know, and so there was one child left. Well, in the first one, he... Dude, it, I'm getting goosebumps it, it, again. Oh, that's creeping me out so bad. And so when they... And so all that and everything, um, and but just seeing this little girl who was huddled in a closet and stuff like that that was murdered that way. Well, it makes me you know sad I mean? because, okay, the first story they tell, everybody was sleeping, nobody woke up. I'd like to believe that because I would hate for them to experience that but right then and it um, would be there was emf energy and other evidence caught in this closet i do believe one of the girls downstairs hid in that closet because she heard what happened or the guy walking around she knew something was happening right. so she tried to hide and he already knew who was there mm -hmm. right and it would be hard not to hear not to hear what happened because that house creaked, and I'm sure it creaked a hundred years ago or whatever. Well, you not know even I mean? that, but like when you're sleeping next to your sister, and he didn't even right. use the sharp edge of the axe. He was using the blunt end to bash in mm -hmm. these heads, except for I think the parents, he used the sharp edge. Um, right, he did. Yeah, but with everyone else, it was the blunt edge, so it was blunt force trauma. How could you right. not feel or hear or wake up to that? But for the most yeah. part, they did sleep through it. But I think one of the girls heard something or maybe she was, you know, experiencer and, and couldn't sleep. Mm -hmm. So, I, you know, so just seeing all that and experiencing that 
and and just smelling the blood. Remember, I talked about uh, like going into the morgue and that type of thing and smelling yeah. death and all. And that copper and smell but, of blood. Right, and but just smelling that, and um, now there were droplets of blood on the um, on the comforter or the blanket that I was laying on. Oh, now wow. was that now was that blood from the actual murder? I'm not really sure. You know, or was it put there for you know for the ambiance of it or sure. whatever? Yeah, yeah. You know, so it's kind of like it's. God knows what Ghost Adventures did when they went in there and stuff like that. Besides right? breaking the bed. <laughs> but um, anyhow, but just to but just to feel everything that I felt in there. But like I said, I did go to the basement where they thought that the guy could have gone that way and through up through the house and such like that, which is very safe, feasible. He could have gone that way, right, and done it. Um. But I just sat there in the, I sat there in the cellar and I was touching the walls, the old brick walls and such, right? Mm -hmm. And some, there, there's a crawl space and such. And just feeling everything, all this energy, especially when you get dirt and it's not, you know what I mean? And, you know, and all that and everything. And just, but just to feel that energy. The earth absorbs so much stuff, so much energy and everything. Mm -hmm. Right. And there was, there, there was a crawl space. And just putting my hand back there, hell, I could have been written, bitten by a snake or a rat for all I would have known. You know what <laughs> <Right>? I mean? <laughs> but I just put my hand back there, and, um, and, and, and apparently I was supposed to do it because there was, there was some of the old brick still back there, right, and everything from the original, right? And so I, apparently that my angels wanted me to experience that. So I picked a brick up. It was like half a brick and stuff like that. And uh, so I took it with me the next day. But just feeling that, feeling, feeling that energy with the dirt down there, the smelling of the mustiness, you know what I mean? And having this brick that was actually part of the house at that time and stuff like that. And But just feeling that energy. But again, it was the overwhelming sadness. It was... But then there's also joy of hearing these little girls playing. Yeah, at least they're playing. laughing and playing still and not just like in a state of sadness. And... Right. But then the slideshow of the goal I saw. Oh. And the parents did struggle and such like that. And it was not a fast death by no means for the parents. I know every Not story they tell, they're like, "Oh no, they all slept through it. Give me a break. Who yeah. could sleep through that?" Yeah. Right. That's not. That is not possible. It's not. I mean, unless unless that they were decapitated and it went very fast. You know what I mean? And uh, but that wasn't the case. No. And they did feel pain. They did feel. They did know what was going on. One could not. <laughs> One could not walk through that house with other people knowing that no one was there. You know what I mean? You had to know. Uh, and, you know, and again, the house is, is in the same condition that it was when, you know, when it happened. It was wood floors. It was this creaky old staircase, which was very narrow, very, very narrow, mm -hmm. right? So that creaked. There is no way in hell that nobody knew that, you know, people had to know. Someone had to wake up during through this. What I'm sensing and feeling that the parents did wake up, but again, there was no bathroom inside. You had to go outside and pee. They had a privy outside, an right. outhouse, right? Okay, so their parents could have thought maybe one of the kids got up and just went to the bathroom, you know? And so that's a possibility too. So there's always these, you know, conspiratory things and, you know, and you'll, you'll hear a hundred stories and such, maybe a million. But it's just the fact of seeing the slideshow, of seeing the gore, seeing, seeing the innocence of these children, seeing the little girl who was in the closet, seeing that. I feel that so bad for her. her. Yes. I think she had you know, the worst experience ever. I think he's like, okay, lay yeah. back in bed. If you lay back in bed, I won't hurt you, blah, blah, blah. And then he did. And I don't know if you heard about the bacon thing, but that was pretty disgusting, too. Right. And so there are a lot of things. You know, and during that time, 
I mean, the cops didn't know how to investigate something like that. You know, I mean, the DNA, of course, that was even, you know, played no part in it when it come to, you know, when it comes to fingerprints and all that stuff, right? Yeah, it okay. makes me wonder, did they save the cigarette butts and now, you know, they've caught so many killers or figured out who the killers were in the past due to genetics? So it makes me wonder, well, did they keep the cigarette butts or did they throw them out? Oh, this is trash. Right, right, right. Well, let me tell you, there, there were cigarettes left in that house. Oh, wow. Okay. Okay, but the cigarettes that were left in the house in certain rooms, okay, they had filters on them. So fil- Yeah, and so those aren't old school filters. cigarettes. No they're, not, no, they're not. They're not like the old Lucky Strikes and Chesterfields, right? And, uh, and, uh, but, but it was weird, how, weird what people would leave. Like, they would leave, like people had left cigarettes. And people will leave change, like quarters and pennies and such like that, um, in one of the kids' rooms, okay? Wow. Um, different dolls and such like that. Yeah, I can and see so the I dolls and stuff, but cigarettes and coins, and maybe, I don't know, they're trying to get this person, this individual that did kill them, to come out of the cracks and communicate, hey, look, I brought you some cigarettes. Mm-hmm. Right. And I just thought it was bizarre to leave anything like that. And so maybe it was used for a trigger object, as they say, right? Um, but I know people experience, will see experience like balls will go down the floor, would do all sorts mm-hmm. of things. And so I never experienced that. But just being in that house and the slideshow that I saw of these children and this family being murdered and such like that. And, you know, and still it, it remains, as far as I know, an open case. Uh, they did put, I think, several people possibly on trial. I know one person at least. And Even that preacher, didn't they put him on trial? And then they're like, nah, you can go. And, well, he, well, he, he was acquitted yeah. by it. Just like that. I just kind of feel like it was him. And they talk about that train dude. Yes, it could have been him. Yes, he has murdered other people, but... That preacher right. was there at that tent event. That preacher saw all the cute little mm-hmm. girls in that group. That preacher. Right. Um, didn't he decide to take some sort of a trolley or train ride that day or whatever? Uh, right. Something different than he usually would have done. Like, just to try to have some sort of motive. Like, not motive, but mm-hmm. uh, this is what I was doing. No way could I have been there, even though this happened right. at night. Right. You know, and, and there was, and again, all these conspiracies, like one of the stories, like I said earlier, was about that, the, uh, that the husband, the father was, uh, very, they, they were wealthy for that time. Okay. Yeah. And that did he screw somebody over? That's what they're they saying. Somebody at work was pissed off. off. I don't think that was it. I think it was that preacher dude, the pastor. Right. I, you know what? It could be, you know, <clears throat> see, I think, it could be it, it could be the preacher itself. It could have been the guy because a lot of guys hopped the trains back then. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? And you know, like you said, the railroads right there. It is. I mean, you uh, you could hear it. I mean, it was, and it was just not like one maybe five out every five hours. It was like every twenty minutes, half an hour that the train you could hear it you could hear the train horn and everything and then there's and so a story like, it could have been the pastor and that train dude maybe they met maybe they collaborated you know how now uh different pedophiles and people will get together online maybe these guys could see each other for what they were and was like hey mm-hmm. i know the perfect house so right train dude stayed so downstairs with his roll of bacon doing his yucky yucky stuff down there while the preacher was upstairs mm-hmm. killing everybody else and then he waited for the preacher to come downstairs and finish off the job I don't know. Right. And so there's a lot of things. But within my slideshow, I saw one person. I saw one person. It was a male. I did not see his face and such like that. And it was just horrendous. You know, it was horrendous. I will never forget that experience. I prayed when I was there also. Um, I'm so glad you did because not a lot of people do. And so I prayed there. Like I said, we left some dolls and. Um, and such like that for the kids to play with and such. Uh, but again, there are a lot of people who go there, Tessa, and they don't feel a damn thing. Nothing. No, Nothing they're just there for the experience. But that's why I was like, I'm yeah. glad you prayed because a lot of people don't. They just go there for the chills and thrills of it. And you went there and you actually prayed and you were reverent and you had a certain respect mm-hmm. that a lot of people wouldn't. So I appreciate that. Very respectful. 
So when I owned that brick, remember I, of, I put my hand to, <laughs> right. to this. Um, and, uh, anyhow, in, in the cellar, and um, and so the next day the owner was there. We gave him the key back. He asked about our experience and such like that. And and um, and I said, can I have this brick? He says, sure, take it. No problem. That's awesome. So, I have so you so did I take have something from the site. Oh, my goodness. I did. Yeah, I did. Well, we I have did. less than a minute left uh, for the last of the show. Would you like to tell our listeners where they can find you, communicate with you, ask you any mm -hmm. sort of questions? Yes, please. Uh, I always give my telephone number out. It's 309-213-0325. If you want to send me a friend request, I am on Facebook, Robert Riggi, R-I-G-H-I. And there are many, many Robert Riggies out there, okay? And my profile is of a, um, and this, um, this was in Colorado, I took this picture. It is of a fast running stream going over these rocks. Okay, and that is my profile picture, okay? So if somebody wants to send me a friend request, and but again, thank you, Tessa. And but my experience at the Valeska House, I will never forget that. It's just one of the experiences in my life. And next time, my brothers and sisters who are listening to this, by the grace of God, Tessa uh, uh, has allowed me to come back on next time again. And I will be talking about my uh, my experiences with our Navajo brothers and sisters. And I learned so much going into sweat lodges and also going to these beautiful Sangria Mountains and talking about skinwalkers oh, and yeah. Bigfoot and such like that, okay? So I'm looking forward to the next time that I will be with my wonderful, beautiful Colorado friend. And my brothers and sisters who are listening, thank you for listening in. Jemima, I am praying for you, okay? Very, very proud of you. Keep up the good work, my sister. I'm God so proud of her, you. too, and I think... She might have gone to sleep. She's like, man, I'm going to try to get some sleep. Good night, everyone. And I was like, we got 38 minutes left. You can make it. Um, but maybe <laughs> she's still listening to us. But I am so proud of her, too. But thank you so much again, Robert, for being on. I really do love and appreciate you being here. And I'm so grateful that we, we have met in this crazy thing we call life. And uh, we can share our experiences together. But thank you again for being on We Are Paradox Media's Late Night in the Rockies. It's been awesome. Thank you so very much. And God bless you. And you and your family remain, remain in my prayers. Love you, honey. I love you, too. Thank you so much. And thank you to all of our friends on We Are Paradox Media's Facebook, Spreaker, KPNL Radio, Twitter, Periscope, iHeartRadio, wherever else beyond the Omniverse you may be listening tonight. I had a wonderful time, and I can't wait to do it again. Tomorrow night, we have Mr. Travis Willier Moose Juice, and we're going to be, uh, be talking about native lore, different things that happen within... Um, artwork, spirituality, etc. You guys, night and night, love and light. Uh, don't forget, we are all in this together, and together we can make.